So after wading through the sewage of Amazon's rings of power for a few months, I thought it might be a good idea to wind back the clock by 11 years to the long, long ago. The before times, known as 2012. This was the year the Avengers first teamed up, the year Batman rose, the year Taken's daughter got taken again, the year the sky fell, the year the Twilight Saga broke dawn for the second time, and the year Jennifer Lawrence became the first ever woman to be in a movie. Most importantly though, given the topic of this video, it was also the year of The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Nearly a decade after releasing the much acclaimed Lord of the Rings trilogy, Peter Jackson returned to give us The Hobbit. Now then, there was much drama behind the scenes, and to call the production troubled would be something of an understatement. Other people have already covered the backstage goings on regarding this trilogy, so before I dive in myself I will quickly lay out my intention with this analysis. I am not interested in what went on behind the scenes, I am interested in what we see on screen. As you may know, I have no interest in just bashing a movie or show repeatedly for clicks. I am far more interested in what works, what doesn't, and why. There is quite a lot in the Hobbit movies that I like, and there is a lot that I intensely dislike. I think there is probably a fantastic three hour movie somewhere in this nine hours of butter scraped over too much bread, but alas, I have to work with what we actually got and take the movies as they are. The Hobbit is also one of the rare books that I have actually read, although as with my Rings of Power videos, I am not going to reference lore accuracy whatsoever when determining how good or bad any particular component is. I have also decided to cover the extended versions of the movies for this analysis, as this will allow me to make sure I can catch all of the good and all of the bad. And I was going to say, with that out of the way, let's return to Middle Earth, but that <laughs> isn't fair. When I covered Rings of Power, we were never in Middle Earth. We were in some bastardized cynical skin suit version of Middle Earth, so let's put that travesty out of our minds as much as possible, although I may well draw one or two comparisons, and wind the clock back to 2012 to return to Peter Jackson's interpretation of Tolkien's Middle Earth. So the film opens pre-Lord of the Rings with a voiceover from Bilbo Baggins. He has decided to write Frodo a letter telling him of his past adventures, adventures which will form the narrative of the Hobbit movies. I would argue that this opening minute or so is an example of fan service done to perfection. Using Ian Holm's Bilbo Baggins as a framing device for delivering exposition accomplishes multiple things. Firstly, it draws a narrative link between the Hobbit movies and the Lord of the Rings. And secondly, it informs the audience as to the relevant history for the story we are about to see unfold. Including Ian Holm's Bilbo is not simply the jangling of keys to trigger the release of dopamine in the audience's collective monkey brain, it is very much justified by the context in which it appears. This opening minute could have been skipped and we could have started immediately with the history of Erebor, but using Bilbo to frame the story as a flashback is, in my view, a fantastic way to open the movie. Anyway, Bilbo tells us of the city of Dale and the kingdom of Erebor. Erebor was apparently the greatest kingdom of Middle-earth, and we see the dwarves of Erebor accumulate vast amounts of wealth. Eventually, the dwarves uncovered the Arkenstone, referred to as the Heart of the Mountain. As a result of their vast wealth, including the mysterious Arkenstone, the other races of Middle-earth would travel to Erebor to pay tribute to him, including the elven king Thranduil. Tensions then rose between the elves and the dwarves. The elves' view was that the dwarves had stolen treasure that was rightfully theirs, and the dwarves' view was that the elves should be paying them for being super totally awesome and shit. And as a result, the alliance between the elves and the dwarves was broken. We then see King Thor surrounded by mountains of gold, and Bilbo tells that his love of gold had grown too fierce, referring to this as a sickness of the mind. As a result of this, Smaug the Fire Drake attacks and destroys Dale. He then breaches Erebor, driven by his intense desire for gold. As Thorin and the dwarves prepare to fight Smaug, the king retreats and takes the Arkenstone with him. I will note that given how incredibly valuable this thing is for reasons that have not yet been explained, I find it rather jarring how if any particular dwarf was so inclined, they could apparently walk up to the throne, press a button, and hide it in their pocketses. Anyway, we only see glimpses of Smaug in An Unexpected Journey, as they are quite obviously saving him for film two. Thorin has lined up the dwarves to defend Erebor from the dragon, and they are then annihilated because of course they are. This means that even though Thorin is presumably very aware of dragons and the threat that they pose, he is also unaware that lining up in front of a dragon is something of a bad idea. 
Although we don't see Smaug, I think it is reasonable to suggest that Thorin must have seen Smaug and therefore knew how gigantic he is, meaning that his decision to line up his soldiers by the front door of Erebor and wait is a rather silly one. You may be thinking, well, what the hell else was he supposed to do? He, he's got to defend Erebor, and my response would be that against a monster this big, there is nothing you can do. You will all die. Except that because of manipulative editing, Thorin doesn't die, despite being right at the front of the army and directly in front of the fire-vomiting Smaug. Anyway, Smaug manages to get into the Gold Horde, and King Thror accidentally loses the Arkenstone into the Sea of Riches. The dwarves were then forced to abandon Erebor, and Bilbo tells us that a dragon will guard his plunder as long as he lives. This seems to indicate that acquiring massive amounts of gold and sitting on it is just kind of the way dragons are, and that the Arkenstone is just a nice bonus. This raises the question, however, as to why exactly the king was becoming sick in the mind. Was it because he was unfathomably rich and he simply loved gold too much? Was it because massive quantities of gold have magical effects? Was it because the Arkenstone is some kind of magical artifact that was corrupting him in a somewhat one ring or evil sword type manner? The film later suggests that Thor's bloodline has some kind of predisposition towards being a bit crazy, but this isn't really elaborated on. Anyway, as the dwarves evacuate, we see King Thranduil observing from a distance. His presence here is potentially convenient, as there is no immediately explicable reason for him being there, However, as I will cover in a moment, this doesn't actually matter. Thorin yells for assistance and Thranduil declines to help. The dwarves of Erebor, now homeless, became nomads and wandered the wilderness. Because The Hobbit is not written by morally confused simpletons, we are not told how they intermittently left each other to die. Sorry guys, I'm still not over that. Thorin, we are told, took work labouring in the villages of men, meaning that either his title of prince is literally meaningless now that Erebor has been lost, or that he has decided to eschew formalities and embrace a new life. However, we are told that Thorin never forgave the elves and never forgot his home, and the events that drove him from it. So, that was quite the exposition dump. Although I had a few criticisms, I think it's fair to say that any visual or logical problems with this entire prologue section are ultimately irrelevant. As the prologue is contextualized by Bilbo telling Frodo a story, it is entirely possible and even likely that he is either embellishing parts, making things up, or has forgotten details. Well, all good stories deserve embellishment. Bilbo may well be an unreliable narrator to some degree, as he tells us of the history of Erebor. What is important, though, is that the character of Thorin is very firmly established. He feels betrayed by Thranduil and the elves. He longs to retake his home. He is a brave and competent warrior, and he is driven by both loyalty and duty. Although the focus is primarily on Erebor, the Arkenstone, Smaug, and Thorin, we repeatedly cut back to Bilbo narrating as he writes his letter to Frodo. This ensures that this prologue never feels like the screenwriters are simply talking to the audience. As the film is about to introduce Martin Freeman's portrayal of younger Bilbo as well as Gandalf, I want to stick on the placement of this prologue for a moment. A running theme with this trilogy, which will become painfully apparent, is that it exists in the shadow of the Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings opened with a narrated prologue informing the audience as to who the Dark Lord is and of what the Rings of Power are. No, 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 not you. G get get the, the fuck out. No, there we go. That's better. The prologue to The Hobbit tries to be epic and definitely to some degree succeeds. It can also be a generally good thing to have an action scene positioned at the start of the movie to hook viewers in, provided it is justified, which in this case I feel it is. However, by opening the movie with the history of Erebor and Thorin, it heavily suggests that the bulk of the narrative is going to be about Thorin defeating the dragon and reclaiming his homeland. The impression from the very start of the movie is that the Hobbit, Bilbo, is not the focus of the story, despite the movie being called The Hobbit. To be somewhat consistent with my standards, they could call the movie Thorin's Quest or something, and this would not directly affect how good or bad it is. I just find it rather interesting that they seem to want to push the focus away from Bilbo and onto the dwarves. Their reasons for doing this are something I will likely cover in a final autopsy of The Hobbit, which I will release to close out this series. Okay, so we learned that Smaug is incredibly large, has extremely thick and impenetrable armor. We learned that Thorin despises elves due to Thranduil's betrayal. He wants to retake Erebor. He is a brave warrior. 
and he is dutiful and loyal. And Thranduil is a colossal douchebag and is super jelly. And then we rejoin old Bilbo before he flashes us back 60 years and turns into Martin Freeman. Well, it began as you might expect, in a hole in the ground. There lived a hobbit. So, if you were unaware, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit is the opening line from the book that this movie is based on. This line serves multiple purposes. Firstly, member berries. <laughs> Secondly, a means of framing the flashback that the entire trilogy takes place in. And thirdly, because Bilbo has literally just written these words in a letter for Frodo to read. Pay attention, modern writers. This is how you do nostalgia baiting. Make it make sense in universe. Anyway, as Bilbo continues writing and reading what are the first few lines from the book, we see Frodo walking around looking simultaneously a decade older than when we last saw him, but also exactly the same age. And he then proceeds to check the mailbox before directly interacting with Bilbo. Thank you. What's this? This feels entirely unnecessary. Seeing Frodo walking around in the background is a cool little gimmick that is not entirely unjustified, but actually dedicating screen time to having Frodo and Bilbo have a chat feels like an abject waste of time. Don't waste my motherfucking time! Anyway, Frodo interrupts Bilbo's writing, making him impatient, and Frodo then picks up what appears to be a dwarven armored helmet. Again, I have no idea why this is here. It does not tell us anything new. We already knew what Bilbo was writing about, and Frodo is an utterly irrelevant character in this story. If this movie were made before The Lord of the Rings, Frodo would not be in this movie. That is as clear a way I can think of to say that this absolutely should have been cut. Anyway, we then get more wasted time tying the movie in with Fellowship of the Ring, indicating that Bilbo's birthday party that takes place at the beginning of Fellowship happens later this same day. Good gracious. Is it today? Bilbo then proceeds to complain about the Sackville Bagginses, because if you recall, they were in the other movie, and, and I, they were, I remember the name, and they were, it made me, and I like. We then get overt repetition of the beginning of Fellowship of the Ring, with Bilbo acting suspiciously and Frodo showing concern. Frodo then name drops Gandalf and runs off to surprise him, which if you recall is where we first met Gandalf in Fellowship of the Ring. All of this serves one single purpose, and that purpose is irrelevant to the story being told. Therefore, it is inefficient and a waste of time. The only reason this sequence exists is because people like the Lord of the Rings and so there has to be a scene with Frodo and Bilbo. It does not provide any new information and any conflict present is only relevant to the beginning of The Fellowship of the Ring, and it was of course already established within that movie. So, we are now 14 minutes into the movie and the story has not started yet. We've had a prologue introducing Thorin and Erebor, and we've had inconsequential character interactions between future Bilbo and future Frodo. This is unfortunately going to become a running theme with these movies. When they're good, they're occasionally very good. The rest of the time, they're extremely bloated and pointless. Anyway, let us continue. So the actual transitional flashback turning Ian Holm into Martin Freeman, I really like. Bilbo is sitting on his bench smoking his pipe as he narrates that in those days nothing unexpected ever happened and we follow the smoke ring up into the sky and we see the title card, An Unexpected Journey. Then Gandalf, known to the audience and potentially Bilbo at this point as a disturber of the peace, disturbs the peace by turning the smoke ring into a magic butterfly firework and sending it into Bilbo's face. This was going to be a point of criticism, but it becomes clear that they actually have met prior to this, and that Gandalf wasn't introducing himself by shooting magic into Bilbo's face. Anyway, Gandalf states that he is seeking someone to share in an adventure, because as we learn from Rings of Power, adventures have to be shared, otherwise they're journeys, apparently. Bilbo is understandably very confused and tells Gandalf that hobbits dislike such things. Gandalf then explains who he is, and we learn that they met when Bilbo was very young. He then says, well, I'm pleased to find you remember something about me, even if it's only my fireworks. Well, that's decided. It'll be very good for you, most amusing for me. I shall inform the others. And in response, Bilbo, despite remembering who Gandalf is, retreats into his house, repeating that he has no desire to go on an adventure. I will say at this point that Ian McKellen as Gandalf is fantastic as always, and casting Martin Freeman as Bilbo is honestly perfect. I also find it very amusing how the archetypal call to adventure present in the hero's journey in this case is a literal call to adventure. 
Gandalf literally shows up and says, we are going on an adventure. Anyway, we then see Gandalf marking Bilbo's door with what appears to be a dwarven rune. This is quick, but unnecessary. Yes, it presumably tells the dwarves where to go, but we have to assume that Gandalf already told them where to go, unless we're expected to believe that the dwarves literally went door to door in the Shire looking for the one with the rune. Anyway, we then see Bilbo going about his day, and we see the various denizens of the Shire doing what hobbits do. This is, again, entirely pointless. Even if we disregard the Lord of the Rings, the introduction scene of Bilbo and Gandalf had already established the lifestyle that hobbits prefer, and having this silly sequence of Bilbo trying to hide from a pillow thinking that it's Gandalf is totally unnecessary because it does not provide any additional information. Okay, so Gandalf is playful, is entertained by Bilbo's reluctance to go on an adventure, and takes Joseph Campbell's writing very literally. Okay, Bilbo dislikes the idea of thrills and adventures, and is content with living a simple life. Well, Bilbo, you think you can sit down and eat your traditional British dinner, but unfortunately for you, the hero's journey is a persistent mistress who will throw 13 midgets at you and steal the contents of your larder. All right, backing up for a moment, because I don't want to gloss over this. I really do think that this movie could be improved by removing the prologue involving the dwarves. Although it was justified in-universe, and although conveying that information to the audience is essential, it could have been done later in the story. By removing that sequence and the pointless insert shot of Gandalf drawing a rune on the door, it would mean that the arrival of a gaggle of dwarves would have been as much a surprise to the audience as it was to Bilbo. Remember when I said Martin Freeman is a perfect Bilbo? This. This is why. Anyway, he opens the door and the dwarf there introduces himself, unprompted, as Dwalin before inviting himself into Bilbo's home. Although Dwalin is a dwarf, he is much larger than Bilbo and is very intimidating. Dwalin, having been promised by Gandalf that there would be food, helps himself to Bilbo's dinner and Bilbo, understandably, does not stop him. Here we see very clearly the disparity between their two cultures and mannerisms. Dwalin is a typical dwarf, he is insensitive and blunt and appears to be an experienced fighter. Bilbo is a typical hobbit, he is polite, timid and does not like surprises. Well done writers, this is how you develop multiple things at once. Why did you two not watch The Hobbit before writing Rings of Power? Then Bilbo reluctantly hands Dwalin more food. Before he can get any answers as to why there is a dwarven warrior in his kitchen helping himself to his dinner, the doorbell rings again, and we are introduced to Balin, who is much older and friendlier than Dwalin. Bilbo greets him with a very confused good evening, to which Balin responds, yes, yes it is, evidently thinking that Bilbo was just randomly stating that it's a nice evening. Soon after, Bilbo attempts to put his foot down and eject the dwarves, saying, I'm sorry, to which Balin responds, apology accepted. Again, this is efficient writing. The writers are reinforcing the cultural differences between hobbits and dwarves as Balin does not understand what Bilbo is trying to communicate, and they are informing us of the characters in question. Balin asks if he is late, and then notices that Dwalin has already arrived, and they embrace. <laughs> Bilbo, now very confused and clearly very uncomfortable, politely interrupts the two dwarves and suggests that they may be in the wrong house. The two dwarves ignore him and help themselves to Bilbo's food. After unsuccessfully attempting to eject the two dwarves, the doorbell rings for a third time, and we are introduced to Feely and Keely. Feely and Keely, at, at your service. service. So, Balin and Dwalin both look like dwarves. Feely and Keely do not. Feely at least has some dwarfy braids in his hair and his mustache, but Keely literally just looks like some guy. It will become clear why they made this choice by the time we reach film number two, so for now, I will just say that the designs for the dwarves is inconsistent. Anyway, Feely and Keely both seem very friendly. You must be Mr. Boggins. No, you can't come in, you come to the wrong house. At which point Bilbo attempts to shut them out as he has already overdosed on excitement, and Keely asks Bilbo, What? Has it been cancelled? No one told us. Can no, nothing's been cancelled. That's a relief. So this is all very amusing and entirely in character for Bilbo. 
To contrast this with Rings of Power, remember way back in my first video where I explained that because Galadriel was such an unlikable sock puppet of a character, it was impossible to actually build any other characters off her. This was in relation specifically to Elrond, who in episode 1 I actually didn't despise. Point being, the way Galadriel was written prevented us from learning anything about the characters she was speaking to through their dialogue. Conversely, in this sequence in The Hobbit, we are learning a lot about Bilbo. His values are being challenged. He is extremely polite and does not want to cause a fuss, but at the same time, his home is being invaded by foreigners who are stealing all his food. If I had a nickel! And perhaps more critically, as Bilbo has already been established prior to this scene, the writers are using Bilbo to inform us of the various dwarves. As will become clear, there are 13 of these motherfuckers. The movie has to be quick and efficient with their introductions. We have to know the baseline information about these dwarves in as little as 10 seconds because there are so many of them and runtime is not infinite. And for now at least, the film achieves this goal. This sequence is repetitive by definition. The bell rings, there is a dwarf, and Bilbo becomes increasingly frustrated. But the reason why it works and the reason why it does not feel repetitive is because of the amount of character that the movie is conveying with each ring of the doorbell. At least, that has been the case thus far. So Bilbo goes to answer the door for what turns out to be the final time. If, if this is some Lothead's idea of a joke, it is in very poor taste. And as funny as this is because of the rather excellent comedic timing, it is strange that the dwarves were all pressed up against the door so tightly that they would just fall over. Seems to me as if they disregarded logic in order to have a funny, unfortunate. And everything seemed to be going so well. So anyway, the dwarves have a drunken party in Bilbo's dining room, and none of them appear to care much for the damage they are causing or the mess they are making. Masticate these dwarves! My dear Bilbo, what on earth is the matter? Gandalf seems to find the whole thing very amusing, as he is thoroughly entertained by Bilbo's frustration with the dwarves. The remaining six dwarves who all arrived at once are all very forgettable, and I would argue mostly pointless. As will become clear, the movie is almost hamstrung by the fact that there were 13 dwarves in the book, so there have to be 13 in the movie. Dwalin, Balin, and Thorin are all extremely well characterized. Feely and Kili are also characterized more than the others, although they very much seem to have the same personalities as each other. I don't think this is a hot take, but maybe it is. The remaining eight dwarves could be cut from the movie and it would be to its benefit. Anyway, here's a quick fire of what we get in this scene for the remaining dwarves. One of them has an axe lodged in his skull and as a result seems to be... Let's go with primitive. One of the others is partially deaf. Dead? No, only between his ears. One of them is a horizontally challenged cheese fiend. Cheese knife. He eats it by the block. One of them is a homosexual. A little glass of red wine is requested. It's uh, got a fruity bouquet. Oh. Cheers. And one of them has crippling learning difficulties. Excuse me. I'm sorry to interrupt, but what should I do with my play? So this line of dialogue is used to lead into the musical number, and evidently this line was not in the original script. Instead of having this guy speak and behave like a nervous five-year-old with too many chromosomes, the script originally had Balin say, sorry, I hate to interrupt, but where would you like me to put my plate? Which is, you know, a totally normal way to communicate the exact same thing. Why they changed this? I have no fucking idea. And the dwarves then proceed to clean up after themselves, accompanied by a musical number. Blunt the knives, bend the forks, smash the bottles and burn the corks. Smash the wine on every door. I am in two minds about this, and the reason for that is that Rings of Power has literally fractured my brain. Where were we? Oh yeah, this musical sequence would not be out of place in a truly faithful adaptation of The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. This film adaptation, however, has taken what is essentially a children's story and attempted to turn it into a fantasy epic on the same scale as The Lord of the Rings. As a result, this sequence feels very out of place in the movie in which it has been inserted, even though it really shouldn't. The reason for this is all the other shit that has been added to the mixing pot, making this trilogy less of an adaptation of The Hobbit and more of an epic prequel to The Lord of the Rings. So a final note before Thorin arrives, we don't know with certainty what exactly Gandalf told the dwarves. We only know that he told them that there would be lots of food. We don't know exactly what they expected Bilbo to be or to be aware of. Therefore, I can't criticize them too harshly for their extremely inconsiderate behavior. This all appears to be a part of Gandalf's plan. What that plan is remains to be seen. Okay, so Bilbo is... 
very timid and is extremely patient and polite when his values are challenged. Okay, Dwalin is intimidating and blunt. Balin is friendly and polite. Feely is a fighter. Keely is an imposter dwarf. He is disrespectful because he wipes his feet on Bilbo's furniture. And is messy. Ori is a spaz. Biffa has an axe in his face, so is presumably a fighter and is cognitively challenged. Oin is deaf. Dory is gay. Bomber is fat. So that leaves Buffer, Gloin, and Nori. Wait, Nori, what the? Anywho, so there is one last knock at the door. Notably, Thorin is the only guest who knocks on the door rather than using the bell. I don't think there's anything we can draw from his character with this, so most likely they just used a knocking sound effect rather than ringing a bell to make him sound more intimidating and to make him stand out from the other dwarves. So, Thorin greets Gandalf and says he got lost twice on the way, only finding Bilbo's house due to the mark on the door. I can totally understand any number of these dwarves, even Thorin, getting lost in the Shire, as they're going to be totally unfamiliar with it. I can also understand Gandalf marking Bilbo's door in order to make sure they all come to the right place. What I question is why the filmmakers explicitly showed the audience that Gandalf had marked the door because... Mark? There's no mark on that door. It was painted a week ago. There is a mark. I put it there myself. Bilbo and Gandalf discuss whether or not there is a mark on the door. So why waste our time showing us if you are going to then talk about it in the following scene? Anyway, Gandalf introduces Thorin, who does not appear to like Bilbo. After criticizing the fact that Bilbo has no martial skills, Thorin concludes that he does not look like a burglar. This is the first time we get any indication as to what exactly Gandalf told the dwarves, and why he has decided to rope Bilbo specifically into some kind of adventure, when the last time they saw each other, Bilbo was barely a child. A side note, it is possible that they knew each other when Bilbo was older, but this scene heavily implied that Bilbo was extremely young the last time he saw Gandalf. Anyway, the dwarves evidently need a burglar, and this will be elaborated on further in a moment. So Thorin informs the party that he has met with envoys from the Seven Dwarven Kingdoms, although Dane of the Iron Hills will not be assisting them with whatever their quest is. At which point Gandalf shows Bilbo a map indicating their destination. We hear that ravens have been seen flying back to the mountain, as was foretold, indicating that the reign of the beast will come to an end. Boyn has read the portents, and the portents say it is time. So this is quick, but needs a little further inspection. At least two of the dwarves are explicitly confirmed to take this prophecy seriously. We have no indication as to where this prophecy came from. The reason this exists, seemingly, is to explain why the dwarves have waited until now to try to take back their home. Anyway, Boffer then informs Bilbo of Smaug. What beast? Well, that would be a reference to Smaug the Terrible. Airborne fire breather. Teeth like razors, claws like meat hooks. And Bilbo anxiously then says, yes, thank you, I know what a dragon is. And then... I'm not afraid. I'm up for it. I'll give him a taste of the wolfish iron right up his jacksey. <laughs> so, I, I have absolutely no clue why this character is like this. And given that this guy is like this, I have absolutely no idea why he is here. It is quite clear that he is very cognitively impaired, and he is obviously going to be a liability on any kind of mission that requires either combat or stealth. Also, once again, this line was not in the script, which suggests that it was ad-libbed. Actually, on even closer inspection, there are less dwarves in the script, period. When Gandalf runs through their names and says that they are one short, being Thorin, he names Fili Kili Oingloin Dwalin Balin. So my presumption is that Biffa Boffa Bomba Ori Nori and Dori were always an afterthought, and they were simply given lines as and when it could be done for exposition, or for strange, confusing, and jarring characterization. Take your pick. Which likely explains why half of the dwarves are, at this point at least, not characterized at all. Anyway, Balin, being old, experienced, and intelligent, essentially the antonym of Ori, explains that It'll be difficult enough with an army behind us, but we number just 13. Not 13 of the best, not brightest. <laughs> 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 
Keeley then reminds everyone that they have a Gandalf who must have killed hundreds of dragons, and when Gandalf doesn't confirm this, Dory demands to know how many dragons he has killed, and then they all start yelling at each other again. Go on, give us a number. It, this, uh, yeah, this is becoming a pattern. The extra dwarves are all the same character. They each get lines as and when someone has to say a thing in order to progress the scene in a given direction. If you recall, Dory previously was characterized as being very soft-spoken, kind, and polite. Excuse me, Mr. Gandalf, may I tempt you with a cup of chamomile, a little glass of red wine as requested? And now he is suddenly aggressive and short-tempered. Go on, give us a number. Oh well, I guess it's only reasonable that the only dwarves with any kind of consistency are the ones who actually appear in the script. Anyway, Thorin interrupts their arguing and states that others will likely have read the same signs they have, meaning the birds returning to the mountain. He tells us that Smaug has not been seen for 60 years, suggesting that either he has died or has abandoned Erebor. Thorin is unwilling to let anyone else claim Erebor. Do we sit back while others claim what is rightfully ours? Or do we seize this chance to take back Erebor? And I'm still unclear on what chance it is that he's referring to. If he knew that Smaug was dead, then Sure, that's a pretty good chance to take your home back. What you have instead is a vague prophecy that maybe when birds go there you should too. And to be clear here, I don't care whether or not Thorin believes this. The issue I have is that the only reason we are given as to why this narrative is happening in the first place is that there is a prophecy that said it should happen now. Pretty pathetic, huh? Regardless, Gandalf reveals that he has a key, and what do we know about keys? If there is a key, there must be a door. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. I love how you can just see the cogs turning inside this guy's head as he works out what keys do. I also love how keys can be used to open many things, not just doors, meaning that this line was presumably inserted to handhold the audience members, too simple to infer why Thorin's father may have given Gandalf a key to give to Thorin. Anyway, Gandalf proceeds to explain that there are runes on the map that indicate the presence of a secret passage. There's another way in. God damn it, will you stop interrupting the man? I swear this kind of writing has become more and more common in recent years, where they will have a character explain something, and then another character will act as the simple version of Wikipedia to just regurgitate exactly the same information in as reductive a way as possible to ensure that even the least intelligent audience members understand exactly what's going on. That's all well and good for the brainlets, but for those of us with an IQ higher than our age, it's rather frustrating. Anyway, Gandalf informs the dwarves that their doors are invisible when closed, which of course they would already know, and my presumption is that it's not unlikely that Thorin would also know about the location of the secret door, given that he was the Prince of Erebor, and given that he recognized the key that Gandalf just gave him. Either way, this isn't acknowledged, so we just have to assume that no one knows where it is. Luckily, Gandalf knows, somehow, that The answer lies hidden somewhere in this map, and I do not have the skill to find it. Why he believes this is not explained. All that matters is that Gandalf has the map, and that the map is the key. If there is a key, there must be a door. I will slap you! Gandalf then explains that his plan requires stealth, courage, care, and intelligence. Then, the character who possesses maybe one of these four traits says, That's why we need a burglar. Wow, so we really are doing the hand-holding thing, aren't we? So Bilbo then comes to the realization that he is the burglar that they have chosen for this quest, and of course he does not want to accompany them. Dwalin and Balin both agree that Bilbo would be unsuitable, and the dwarves then start to argue once again. Biffa starts doing... <laughs> Seriously, what the fuck is this guy doing? Anyway, then Gandalf does the thing from the other movie because it, we've seen it before and it, 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 he goes dark and it's all the spooky. Anyway, Thorin still does not think Bilbo is at all suitable for the task and Gandalf says that Thorin must trust him. Again, why Gandalf is pushing so hard for Bilbo to join them is at this point a mystery. It seems like Gandalf's goal is to get Bilbo to go on an adventure rather than to successfully retake Erebor. Either way, Thorin decides to trust Gandalf, and he then accepts Bilbo as the 14th member of their company. I cannot guarantee his safety. Understood. Nor will I be responsible for his fate. Agreed. This tells us quite clearly that Thorin still highly doubts Bilbo's usefulness and competence, and he is preemptively washing his hands of any blame if anything bad happens to him. Gandalf's response also indicates that he considers this to be acceptable, presumably because his priority is that Bilbo has an adventure and danger is inherently going to be part of that adventure. Then they do a contract, which is clearly supposed to be funny, although it seems very odd to me that there even is a contract in need of a signature, when there is presumably no legal body capable of enforcing it. 
Then we get another instance of dialogue swapping, where Boffer explains repeatedly to Bilbo how being melted by a dragon works, and as Boffer is not in the script, this line was originally for Feely. This tells us that Boffer is very insensitive. As a result of reading the contract and realizing what may be in store for him, Bilbo faints. Nope. When he wakes up, we then get some very revealing dialogue from Gandalf, which I will read as playing the clip in full would set off the YouTube Gestapo bots. Gandalf explains to Bilbo, and us, why he chose him for this quest. You've been sitting quietly for far too long. When did doilies and your mother's dishes become so important to you? I remember a young hobbit who was always running off in search of elves in the woods. He'd stay out late, trailing mud and twigs and fireflies. A young hobbit who would have liked nothing better than to find out what was beyond the borders of the Shire. The world is not in your books and maps, it's out there. So this very clearly explains what Gandalf's motivation is, or at least what he wants Bilbo to think his motivation is. He believes Bilbo has become old too quickly, and he needs to embrace the way he used to behave when he was younger. He wants him to recover his lost sense of adventure and mischief. This also tells us that Bilbo's behavior when he was younger was abnormal for a hobbit, otherwise Gandalf would presumably not have remembered Bilbo specifically when looking for a burglar for this quest. And I guess it just so happened that the skill set required for this quest could potentially be filled by Bilbo, or at least this is what Gandalf claims to believe. He also tells Bilbo that all good stories deserve embellishment, which may well have been reflected by Bilbo's own storytelling during the prologue. He also says that he cannot guarantee that Bilbo will survive. Can you promise that I will come back? No. And as a result, Bilbo declines to sign the contract. Balin and Thorin discuss the prospect of losing their burglar. Probably for the best. The odds were always against us. After all, what are we? Merchants, miners, tinkers, toy makers. Hardly the stuff of legend. There are a few warriors amongst us. Wait, but I thought you were all fighters. We may be few in number, but we're fighters. All of us. What? Well, which is it? Are you all fighters or are a few of you fighters? Okay, anyway, then we get one of my favorite scenes, partly because Howard Shaw is allowed to just let rip with musical goodness. I can't play it because of the aforementioned YouTube Gestapo bots, but the Misty Mountains musical sequence is, I think, excellent. Firstly, it establishes a musical leitmotif that will return later in the film, although criminally, if memory serves, it does not return in either of the two sequels. It also shows the dwarves collectively reflecting on what their mission may require of them and what it may lead to, giving them a sense of brotherhood as they each start joining in singing. It also provides a dramatic transition to the following morning when Bilbo wakes up to a peaceful and empty house with no trace of the night before, apart from the unsigned contract that has been left behind. Bilbo considers for a moment and realizes that he would in fact prefer some excitement in his life and that Gandalf was absolutely right about him, and potentially that he was moved by the dwarves' dedication to their quest as evidenced by their willingness to set off without him, and so Bilbo rushes out of his house, contract in hand, and declares, I'm going on an adventure! So much as I really do like this, the idea of Bilbo embracing who he really is after a nudge in the right direction from Gandalf, I will note that we are now nearly 44 minutes into this movie. Narratively, we are almost exactly lining up with Fellowship of the Ring, as 44 minutes into Fellowship is the scene where Frodo and Sam watch the elves leave Middle-earth just after they themselves have just left the Shire. The difference is that Fellowship is extremely efficient in its storytelling, whereas The Hobbit is not. At least 15 minutes could have and should have been cut so far. There is no real justification for it taking nearly three quarters of an hour to leave the Shire in a story that is so simple as the one in The Hobbit. Well, actually, the justification is that there is a huge amount of filler. Okay, so Oin is superstitious. Gloin is also superstitious. Ori is incredibly unintelligent and utterly oblivious. Dory is short-tempered and prone to violence, and he also appears to be Ori's carer or handler. Feely is good at identifying the purpose of keys. Thorin respects Gandalf considers Bilbo to be useless, values combat skills, highly values loyalty and honor, and believes he has no choice but to retake Erebor. 
Boffer is insensitive, is unable to read social cues, is knowledgeable about dragons, and is sarcastic. Gandalf wants to push Bilbo out of his comfort zone, wants to help Thorin reclaim his home, and believes good stories need embellishment. Balin values peace and does not care for wealth. And Bilbo is torn between his comfort and his desire for adventure. So Bilbo manages to catch up with the dwarves who are all riding adorable little stubby-legged ponies, which is just fantastic. And then we get more wasted time with Balin checking the contract to make sure everything is in order because if it wasn't and Bilbo had misspelled his name in his signature, then that would of course mean that the contract is void and he can't go with them. Anyway, Bilbo is then given a pony and his reaction strongly suggests that he has never ridden one before, which would be consistent with what we know about him. The dwarves then start tossing bags of coins between each other, implication being that they had placed bets on whether or not Bilbo would come with them. Because, unfortunately, modern movies are constructed so as to be fully understood even by someone who is not actually looking at the screen, the writers made sure to have Gandalf explain to Bilbo that the dwarves had placed bets on whether or not he would come with them. We do, however, get a bit of useful character information from this, as Gandalf himself receives a bag of coins and says that he never doubted Bilbo for a second. We then fast forward to later that evening, and Bilbo finds himself unable to sleep because there is a loud fat next to him. He then approaches the pony that was given to him by the dwarves and feeds her an apple, suggesting that he has grown to like the pony despite his initial reservations about riding her. He is then interrupted by a spooky noise that we are told is orcs. Fili and Kili try to scare Bilbo as a joke by telling him how bands of orcs will sneak up on travelers during the night. Thorin does not approve of this. You think a night raid by orcs is a joke? We didn't mean anything by it. And now it's time to sit down for some story time with Uncle Balin. Before I dive into this, Balin is about to explain why Thorin hates orcs. You may be wondering what orcs have to do with what we already know about Thorin. He should hate dragons and elves, but now he also hates orcs? Come to think of it, he also doesn't like Bilbo. Thorin, I've got my eye on you, buddy. Well, we don't take kindly to folks that don't take kindly around here. Anyway, this right here is where I would have inserted the prologue sequence involving the fall of Erebor. This would mean that Bilbo and the audience are learning about it at the same time. So ditch this nonsense with the orcs and use this downtime to explain a bit of relevant backstory to Bilbo as to why the dwarves are actually doing what they are doing. Anyway, back to the film. Balin explains that after Smaug took Erebor, King Thror, Thorin's grandfather, tried to reclaim Moria in order to move the dwarves there instead. We are told that the enemy, the orcs, had got there first. Either this is very poor wording, or this is being deliberately vague. The way Balin phrases this makes it sound like Moria needed reclaiming from some unknown faction, but by the time the dwarves arrived, the orcs had beaten them there. Through this flashback, we learn that Moria had been taken by legions of orcs, which suggests that when the dwarves initially went there, they did not know that it had been taken over. We then learn that the orcs were led by the most vile of their race, Crixus the Undefeated Ghoul. Uh, wait, sorry, what is it with Lord of the Rings properties and Spartacus sharing the same actors? Azog the Defiler. Azog had sworn to wipe out the line of Durin. Why he did this? I have no fucking idea. So anyway, Azog decapitated King Thrall, which drove Thrain, Thorin's father, mad with grief. So then Thorin and Azog have their fight, and before I make this point, I'm very aware that the same defense can be made as was made for the prologue. This is contextualized as being story time with Uncle Balin. What we are seeing on screen may not be literally what happened. Regardless, Thorin is able to defend himself and block multiple blows from Azog, who is absolutely gigantic and wielding a mace, by holding a tree branch. Armor rent, wielding nothing but an open branch as a shield. If this is what literally happened, then every single bone in his arm would have been destroyed. Remember when the Witch King swung his flail into Eowyn, who was holding an actual shield, and the shield was shredded, and given her reaction, her arm was very likely shattered? Yeah, we don't get any of that here, and Thorin has a piece of wood instead of an actual reinforced shield. Anyway, Thorin manages to chop off Azog's lower arm, and because of the fact that this is a flashback, we can conveniently cut away without having to explain why Thorin didn't finish the job. Azog managed to escape, and Thorin led the dwarves against the remaining orcs and was able to drive them back. Thorin reveals in present day that Azog died of his wounds as a result of their fight. Balin and Gandalf share a glance, implying that... Well, 
It's not as dead as we would have hoped. And then we see that the dwarves are being watched by an orc on his warg. And Jesus Christ, I had forgotten about this. Remember in my Rings of Power video where I mentioned that the wargs in The Hobbit looked like giant edgelord turbo wolves drawn by a 12 year old Transformers fan? This right here is precisely what I am referring to. They look so absurdly evil that it just comes off as comical. This is a problem with a lot of the character design in the Hobbit movies, and it isn't just a question of CGI versus practical. Unless the New Zealandian wildlife includes wolves the size of horses, the wargs in The Lord of the Rings were CGI. And yet, they looked far more believable than these hairy cartoon dinosaurs. Anyway, these two orcs have managed to track Thorin and his party from somewhere to somewhere else. Yeah, this is just bonkers. In The Lord of the Rings, there were very specific reasons as to why the Nazgul were able to locate Frodo. They had tortured Gollum. And whenever Frodo puts the ring on, it reveals his location to them. In The Hobbit, we know that the orcs are looking for Thorin, and they have found him. That's all the information we get, and we simply have to accept that this has happened. Okay, so Gandalf is very confident in Bilbo's ability. Bilbo is nervous and uncertain. Balin is extremely loyal to Thorin. And Thorin is extremely skilled in combat, is willing to face down an enemy much larger than himself. And hates orcs. So as they continue their journey, Gandalf tells Bilbo of the other wizards of Middle-earth, Saruman the White, the two blue wizards whose names Gandalf is not allowed to say, and the fifth wizard is the other massive waste of time in the Hobbit movies, Radagast the Brown. We then follow Radagast doing… well, I'm about to explain exactly what he's doing, but first let's get a look at him. Radagast looks like a cartoon character. His eyes are different colours. He has literal bird shit on his face, and he has a nest under his hat made from his own hair. This character is extremely wacky and exaggerated and therefore feels very out of place in Middle Earth, perhaps feeling more at home in Narnia or Harry Potter or something. So Radagast has found a corrupted leaf, god damn it, why does everything have to remind me of Rings of Power? And he declares this to not be good. He then runs past the corpses of multiple animals, which one would think would have been far more of an obvious indicator that something evil be happening, and he then finds some evil tree goo, go away rings of power, I'm done with you, and then he runs to help a cartoon hedgehog called Sebastian. Seriously, I do not remember any of this, what the holy fuck am I watching? So Radagast tries to fix the hedgehog with a variety of wacky contraptions and potions, none of which have any effect. I don't understand why it's not working, it's not as if it's witchcraft leading him to conclude that dark magic is causing it. And, I, well, I mean, buddy, I could have told you that. All you needed to do was milk the hedgehog, find the black goo, go to Horden, and get all your friends killed. <clears throat> Sorry. Right. Anyway, because of dark magic, giant spiders walk over his house, and then the hedgehog dies. And I say that as casually as it happened on screen. It just kind of happens, and then it's done. There must be giant spiders because it's dark magic, you see. Radagast then sucks the magic out of the hedgehog and it comes back to life, and then the spiders go away. I ask once again, what in the holy fuck am I watching? What does this have to do with anything? Why is this character in the movie? At least Azog was shoehorned in for a purpose. Or to be more specific, at least Azog's purpose is clear from the start. Radagast's character is introduced by having Gandalf say, yeah, there's another wizard somewhere called Radagast. And then we spend about 10 minutes watching Radagast dick about with cartoon animals and bird shit. Anyway, so Radagast then asks a bird to show him where the spiders came from. And then, if you have not seen this movie, brace yourselves, we see that Radagast has a sled that is pulled by rabbits. I'm not even going to dignify this with an explanation as to why it is absurd. But random, he's a wizard, he might be magicking the rabbits. Well, retarded alter ego, much as I welcome your return from Rings of Power, you are nonetheless still retarded. By that logic, his sled could be pulled by ants and you could use the exact same defense. So the cartoon wizard man on his cartoon sled pulled by cartoon rabbits travels through the forest towards the spooky castle. Great, now let's please get back to the Hobbit. Okay, so Radagast loves animals, is somewhat capable as a wizard, and has literal shit on his face. 
Then we cut back to The Hobbit. The party finds a place to camp, but Gandalf suggests that they continue in the direction of Rivendell, as he believes Elrond will be able to help with deciphering the map. Thorin rejects this idea, as he of course intensely dislikes and distrusts elves, stating that he will not go near that place. And Gandalf in response says that he did not give Thorin the map and key for him to hold on to the past, suggesting that part of Gandalf's motivation in helping Thorin retake Erebor is potentially to repair the relations between the elves and the dwarves. Gandalf then leaves in frustration after he is unable to convince Thorin to listen to him, and Bilbo nervously asks if he's coming back. Then we cut forward to later that night and Gandalf still has not returned and Bilbo is becoming increasingly worried. But unfortunately for Bilbo, and for us, things are about to get far worse. Bilbo takes some food to Feely and Keely, who were supposed to be watching the ponies. Supposed to be looking after the ponies. We had 16. Now there's 14. Okay, that's fine. This tells us that these two are less than competent and don't take their jobs particularly seriously. Bilbo then suggests telling Thorin, and Feely says, Didn't we tell Thorin? Uh, no. Let's not worry him. As our official burglar, we thought you might like to look into it. I am starting to think that burglar has a different meaning in Middle-earth, because the word burglar comes from the German words berg meaning house and laron meaning thief. I can understand the word burglar being used in the context of breaking into Erebor. What I have more of a hard time with, though, is Feely thinking that a house thief would be suitable for the task of investigating missing ponies. Anyway, Bilbo uses his powers of burglary to deduce that whatever uprooted those trees must have been big and dangerous which is rather obvious, and also calls into question how exactly the trolls, because it turns out to be trolls, manage to abduct two ponies when there are 13 dwarves very close by, 12 of whom are not deaf, 10 of whom do not have brain damage, and two of whom are explicitly supposed to be guarding the ponies. Anyway, they then see a light and... <laughs> trolls. they decide to run towards the trolls rather than going to get anyone else to help, suggesting that Feely and Keely are willing to risk their lives by running headlong into extreme danger in order to cover up the fact that they were negligent. So Bilbo follows them, and for some reason he brings the soup with him that he was meant to give Feely and Keely, and they tell him, I think they're gonna eat them, we have to do something. Yes, you should. Mountain trolls are slow and stupid and you're so Me, small no. they'll never see no, you. No, no. It's perfectly safe. We'll be right behind you. Okay, yeah, okay, so Bilbo is small, but he's barely smaller than Feely or Keely. Before any of them have a chance to acknowledge that this makes no sense, though, they then push Bilbo in the direction of the trolls and disappear. Are you sure this is a good idea? Mutton yesterday. Mutton today. Okay, so the movie is telling me that Feely and Keely are dicks who do not care about Bilbo's safety. This is unfortunately another trope in more modern movies where characters will put each other in extreme danger. But because of the presentation, it's oftentimes seemingly intended to be funny. Stealth mode is fairly simple. There are just two parts. You push this button, then you go out the front door, and I'll go blow up the Zerg ship. Wait, the timer. They don't know about the timer. Wait, I can see you. I can see you too. Uh, the bugs can see us! We are not supposed to take this entirely seriously. We are supposed to go, oh no, what will Bilbo do? Without actually acknowledging the prospect that Bilbo may now be eaten alive by trolls. Before I continue, I need to make something clear. Ridiculous slapstick and exaggerated absurdity is all well and good, unless your movie takes place in continuity with another story in which this kind of slapstick and absurdity would not and does not fit whatsoever. If The Hobbit were a standalone property, like Rings of Power for example, then it would be able to make its own rules and ideally stick to them. Unlike Rings of Power, The Hobbit is forced to play by the rules of The Lord of the Rings because it takes place within the same continuity. This is the same reason why establishing in The Mandalorian that stormtroopers have comically terrible accuracy with their weapons is a problem, because it affects more than just The Mandalorian. It affects the entirety of the canonical Star Wars universe. If The Mandalorian were an entirely standalone story that did not take place in any established universe, then the ridiculousness of stormtroopers being this incompetent would only affect The Mandalorian. Yes, there were some goofy moments in The Lord of the Rings, such as Legolas surfboarding on a shield down some stairs, but this does not in any way excuse what is about to happen. So Bilbo then approaches the trolls alone, in spite of the fact that he has zero worldly experience, in spite of the fact that he has never seen a troll before. At this point in the story, Bilbo is experiencing the world outside of the safety of the Shire for the first time. 
and upon being presented with three trolls, being told that approaching them is safe, and then being suspiciously abandoned by two dwarves who have already been established to like playing tricks on him, he decides to try and rescue the ponies alone. The point of all of this is very obvious. This is Bilbo's first real test during his adventure. He has the choice of turning away and leaving the hard and or dangerous work to the others, or he can get his hands dirty and prove his worth. The problem is that the plot and character elements that put Bilbo in this position are questionable at best and broken at worst. Anyway, while Bilbo approaches the ponies and tries to free them, we get a hilarious sequence of trolls snorting bogeys into their soup, because I assume this was meant to entertain babies? Remember when Middle Earth was taken seriously? Remember when trolls were intimidating? Anyway, upon realizing that he can't untie the rope, he decides to try and steal a blade from one of the trolls. This is, of course, the writer's way of amping up the stakes. Bilbo is presented with another chance to turn back, or he can put himself in further danger to complete his mission. The problem is that under no circumstances should he or would he be putting himself in further danger. He does not need to do this. Yes, Bilbo has been told that the trolls are slow, blind, and stupid, but he has zero experience with them and thus has no concept of what exactly these parameters mean. As far as Bilbo is aware, at this point, he is alone. The dwarves and Gandalf are not here. The sensible thing to do, as if this even needs saying, is to return to the dwarves and come back in force. That Bilbo does not do this means that either he is incredibly reckless in his determination to save the ponies and prove himself to the dwarves, or that he is simply an idiot with no regard for his own safety. I think the intention here is to portray Bilbo as determined and resourceful. The problem, however, is that because of the setup of this scene, that is not all that it conveys. Anyway, as the scene progresses, it continues to be extremely goofy. Bilbo changes his mind about how to approach the trolls. He tells the ponies to be quiet. The trolls keep having their silly conversation, all obfuscating the fact that Bilbo will die very quickly if he is discovered. And this would all be fine if Bilbo himself were acting in such a way as to be consistent with his awareness of this fact. You can, of course, portray intense or dramatic scenes with a comical twist. This scene, however, in my view, does not work at all, because the central character in question, upon whom all of the stakes are built, is part of the absurdity. His behavior is part of the comedy, and it does not line up with what his behavior should be given everything we know about him. And then, as luck would have it, slapstick meets reality in a moment so ridiculous it could have been ripped from a Saturday morning cartoon. What's come out of me, Uta? Slapstick. Get it? And just as Bilbo is about to be turned into troll food, the dwarves all burst out of the bushes to rescue him. Okay, so this means that they were all watching for a period of time and chose to do nothing. Bilbo could have been killed at any point and they just sat there waiting. This is the kind of thing that writers don't realize they are communicating when they construct scenes. Either that or they think people won't notice. When you have a character such as Keeley burst out of the bushes to rescue Bilbo at the perfect time, it begs the question as to why Keeley chose to do it then. Because of how the scene is constructed to maximize tension and drama, Keeley waits until Bilbo's life is directly threatened in order to resolve the tension with a heroic moment. Drop him! You walk! I said, drop him. The problem is that Bilbo's life was in danger from the moment Feely and Keeley told him to go and get the ponies back. The only reason he waited until now to rescue Bilbo is because this is a scene in a movie. Anyway, we then get a prolonged sequence of the dwarves battling the three trolls. Given that the tone for this entire sequence has been very silly, this means that this battle comes off as something not dissimilar to white noise. There is no danger. There is no risk that someone may die, even though the trolls are massive, and one wrong move could feasibly result in instant death. My mind goes back to the Fellowship of the Ring and the cave troll sequence, which I have brought up a few times in my coverage of Rings of Power. There are moments of levity in that sequence, such as Sam bashing orcs in the head with his frying pan, but broadly speaking, the stakes of that sequence are very clear. Anyone can die, and the Fellowship are fighting for their lives. In this sequence in The Hobbit, they are fighting not one, but three trolls. And I don't care about who does what, because this is essentially background noise. It is generic action scene where they beat the baddies. And the reason why I don't care about it is because the tone of the scene dispenses entirely with realism and consequences. 
One part that I do like, however, is that even while the dwarves are fighting the trolls, Bilbo still perseveres on his mission to acquire the blade and rescue the ponies. He knows he is not a fighter, and he knows that the best thing he can do at this point is to try and save the ponies. And given that the outcome of this sequence is that Bilbo successfully rescues the ponies, this means that actually all of this cartoon nonsense was exactly that. Nonsense. And a waste of time. Anyway, after all the stabbing and slashing and the many, many times when the dwarves should have been killed, the fighting stops. Bilbo! No! Lie down your arms! And, unwilling to allow Bilbo to be killed, Thorin and his company comply. And then, uh, uh, whoa, okay, holy fu- how- You can't hide this from me with an edit. How this happened is a very important question. That it happened implies that there was no way for it to not happen, which I simply don't believe. Because the movie doesn't show us, we now have to accept that Prince Thorin, the extremely capable dwarven warrior, who is highly driven to retake Erebor, and his twelve companions, all of whom have a reasonable level of martial skill or intelligence, or some other reason that would justify Thorin taking them on this mission, have all been stripped of their armor and weapons and are now at the absolute mercy of three trolls whom they themselves describe as halfwits. You can't reason with them, they're halfwits! Yes, part of the reason this happened is arguably because Bilbo allowed himself to be caught and used as leverage, but the entire reason why Bilbo was there in the first place was because Feely and Keeley did not want Thorin to give them a telling off. Anyway, luckily the dwarves are given an out. All night far away. Let's get a move on. I don't fancy being turned to stone. Okay, so this troll has just told Bilbo and the dwarves that they will be turned to stone if they don't hurry up, as when trolls are hit by sunlight they turn to stone. This then gives Bilbo the opportunity to prove his worth again by distracting the trolls until sunrise. I know that the film has already established that these trolls are morons, but even so it's extremely convenient that the troll straight up told them what their weakness is. Anyway, while Bilbo is distracting the trolls, he suggests seasoning the dwarves because they smell nasty, and the dwarves' response is... What? And he then suggests skinning them, and the dwarves' response is... And then Bilbo tells the trolls that all of the dwarves are infested with worms and that they should therefore not eat the dwarves at all. And the dwarves' response is... We don't have parasites! You have par and then, the goddamn penny the size of Galadriel's ego finally fucking drops. I've got parasites as big as my arm! One of the biggest parasites! I've got huge parasites! And Thorin realizes that Bilbo is buying them time. Again, this is all presented as very tongue-in-cheek. The problem is that this is comedy at the expense of characters whom the plot requires that we take seriously. If this were one or two dwarves being goofy morons who don't understand what Bilbo is doing, then I could totally accept this. The comedy in this scene instead relies on all of the dwarves, including Thorin, being retarded. <laughs> The characters act like idiots in order to make the audience laugh. In more cut and dry bad writing such as, I don't know, let's pull a name out of the hat, oh wait, yeah I know, Rings of Power, characters will frequently act like idiots in order to drive the plot. The story cannot be told unless the characters are retarded. In both examples, supposedly competent characters are written so as to momentarily act like idiots, which is of course bad writing, but, at least in the case of The Hobbit, this only services bad comedy rather than the entire progression of the narrative. Anyway, then Gandalf is here and he saves them. <laughs> Alright, now that absurdity is over, the dwarves then investigate the troll's cave looking for anything useful. Inside the cave, they find the elven blades Glamdring and Orcrist, which become Gandalf and Thorin's swords respectively, and the dagger Sting, which Bilbo takes. It is admittedly superficially cool seeing these characters get their weapons, but in a movie already bloated to the gills, this scene also feels indulgent. The only thing I like about it, and the only character information present in this scene, is Thorin's immediate reluctance to take one of the blades after Gandalf informs him that it was forged by elves. These were forged in Gondolin. By the High Elves, the First Age. Do not wish for a finer blade. Only after Gandalf persists that he could not wish for a finer blade does Thorin decide to take the sword to use himself. This suggests that even though he despises elves, he is willing to recognize that they have their uses and they are exceptionally skilled at forging weapons. Choosing to wield an elven blade is Thorin taking his first steps towards repairing his relations with them. Okay, so Feely shirks his responsibilities, is unobservant and is reckless with other people's lives. 
and Keeley, because these two are the same character, is exactly the same. Bilbo is exceedingly brave, wants to prove his usefulness, and is willing to risk his life when others will not. Okay, Gloin really likes gold. Nori also really likes gold. Thorin is very stubborn. Thorin is an idiot, albeit not quite as much of an idiot as the other dwarves, and is willing to use an elven blade after being told of its quality. And then Radagast arrives, so it certainly is a good thing that Gandalf explained to us who he is in the previous scene. Also, how the hell did Radagast know where Gandalf was? Seriously, this is just not explained in the slightest. Radagast has just appeared exactly where Gandalf is after crossing a large portion of Middle Earth on a rabbit sled. Anyway, because this character is a silly goofball, this happens. I was looking for you, Gandalf. Something's wrong. I had the thought, and now I've lost it. It was, it was right there on the tip of my tongue. Oh, it's not a thought at all. It's just a little stick insect. And, predictably, this is not in the script. Then, because we have hit our quota of silly jokes, we then return to the script and cut to Radagast actually explaining why he is there. He explains that the green wood is sick, and that a darkness has fallen over it. He says that he followed the giant spiders to the spooky castle Dol Guldur, and says that it is not abandoned as they had previously thought. We see, through a flashback, that Radagast discovered that a shadow of an ancient horror dwells there, and he tells us that this ancient horror can summon the spirits of the dead. Then this happens. Okay, so firstly, why does this look worse than the Lord of the Rings? Secondly, why is this Nazgul attacking Radagast and thus risking revealing whatever evil plan is afoot here? Anyway, then Radagast sees a spooky ghost man and declares the necromancer has come, and then he escapes on his rabbit sled. Gandalf then gives Radagast a hit of his dank herb, Radagast then makes a silly face, once again not in the script and therefore likely ad-libbed, and inserted due to some studio-mandated joke quota, and then Gandalf asks Radagast if he is sure it was a necromancer, and Radagast reveals the sword that the Nazgul had dropped, stating, That is not from the world of the living. Meaning that everything that happens now as a result of Radagast having this sword, is entirely contingent upon spiders walking over his house, his bird knowing where the spiders came from, and a Nazgul deciding to attack him when it could have remained hidden. No time to actually think about that, though, because it's time for an action scene. Suddenly, Wags. No, that is not a wolf. <laughs> So Gandalf actually raises the same question that I asked earlier. How have the orcs managed to track Thorin? Who did you tell about your quest beyond your kin? No one. Who did you tell? No one, I swear. We don't get an answer yet. We actually don't get an answer in this film, period. Anyway, realizing that they are being hunted, they move to leave, but then they realize that they can't because their ponies have all run off after the incident with the trolls. These guys can't catch a break, can they? Everything is just happening to them all at the same time. So, Radagast then says that he will draw the orcs away while the others escape. These are Gundabad wags. They will outrun you. These are Roscabel rabbits. I'd like to see them try. They are level 34 turbo wolves. Yeah, well, I've got ra Mamadan rabbits. And now we come to the first video game chase sequence in this movie. And when I say video game, that isn't entirely fair. I don't mean to demean or belittle video games as any kind of lesser art form. When I say video game chase sequence, I mean. It comes off as having very little basis in reality, it does not adhere to basic physics, it has incoherent stakes as seemingly anything can happen at any time, and there is subsequently no sense of danger to any of the characters involved, because this is the fun action scene where nothing matters. Just stop thinking about it and watch the silly wizard man with his rabbit sled outrun the cartoon wolf monsters. Pretty pathetic, huh? Alright, sorry for expecting any amount of realism. Remember back in the Two Towers when wags were a genuine threat and there was a true sense of tension that had been built gradu- You know what? It isn't worth the effort. This sequence is so absurd on its face that I'm just gonna skip most of it. 
Firstly, the orcs do not seem to care whatsoever that they are in direct sunlight. This is the first time that the orcs have been seen in sunlight in this movie, so this is not inconsistent within The Hobbit yet. However, it raises questions when placed in context with The Lord of the Rings. Saruman has crossed orcs with goblin men. He's breeding an army. An army that can move in sunlight and cover great distance at speed. As the uruk Hai was specifically bred so as to be able to move in daylight. I am not going to check the entirety of The Lord of the Rings to see if there are any moments when orcs do appear in daylight when they should not, but I am going to assume that that does not happen. In The Hobbit, however, these orcs have no problem with being in sunlight. From a narrative perspective, though, I question why all of the orcs are chasing Radagast when their goal is, as we learn later, to kill Thorin. Also, look at how goddamn wide open these plains are. This is not a small distance that the dwarves have to travel without being seen. And Radagast appears to just be leading the wargs around in a circle nearby. I guess because there is an invisible wall at the edge of this video game level. Seriously, he could have just led them in a straight line for miles in one direction. Instead of doing this because we need to keep the danger in the vicinity of the characters who are ostensibly not invincible, he makes sure to keep bringing the wargs back to the dwarves. Anyway, in terms of character moments during this sequence, Ori nearly runs into the open, totally oblivious to the danger, reinforcing my previous claim that he was a liability. Thorin questions where Gandalf is leading them, suspecting that he is taking them into elven land. And then Thorin reluctantly accepts this, given that he does not really have any other option. In terms of editing, the scene is a mess. The orcs realize where the dwarves are, and yet are unable to catch them despite them being on foot. Each time we see a wide shot, the wargs are seemingly not actually gaining any ground. There is no progression of stakes. There is simply a wide open space, and within this space, somewhere, there are dwarves. And somewhere else, there are orcs. Where they are in relation to each other is a malleable, non-specific abstraction. Eventually, though, the scene does commit to acknowledging spatial reality. The dwarves find themselves surrounded, and then they escape into a hole behind a rock. And then... Okay, so I do not remember this at all. This is either an extended scene, or I had just blanked this from my memory. So going by the horn and the soundtrack, these are elven soldiers, as Thorin confirms in a moment. The elves kill the orcs and then leave. And I find this hilarious. Let me explain. The dwarves are surrounded, conveniently right next to Gandalf's secret hole. The dwarves then escape down the hole. But of course, the wargs are still right there. And even if the wargs themselves are too large to fit down the hole, the orcs could easily still follow them. This presents a problem, because the script wants the dwarves to have escaped, as this is the end of the action scene, but the danger is still present. So, naturally, the solution is to spawn a detachment of elven cavalry to wipe out the orcs. Fantastic. This is what people mean when they say the Hobbit movies feel like a video game. Okay, so Radagast is absolutely useless. Keely is reckless. Thorin is suspicious of Gandalf's motives and is an inspirational leader. So, finally, after 86 minutes, the fellowship- sorry, I mean the company of Thorin arrive at Rivendell. Notably, it actually took them longer to get here than it took Frodo in the Fellowship of the Ring. There is no reason why they couldn't have just left the Shire, skipped Azog, skipped Radagast, skipped the Trolls, skipped the Wargs, and just had them arrive at Rivendell without issue. It is absurd the number of obstacles that they encountered in their journey thus far, and most of it functions purely as filler. And if you're concerned with staying accurate to the book, then fine. Keep the scene with the trolls, but cut it way the hell down. Anyway, upon arriving, Gandalf informs the dwarves as to where it is that they have arrived. The Valley of Imladris. In the common tongue, it's known by another name. Rivendell. Nice, we have some character consistency. We already know that Bilbo used to be enthralled by the outside world, that he would wander around as a child looking for elves in the woods, so it is entirely reasonable that he would know of Rivendell. Of course, Thorin is not happy about this at all. It was your plan all along, to seek refuge with our enemy. You have no enemies here. And Gandalf continues that the reason he has led them here is because they have questions that need answers. He believes Elrond is the only person who can read the map, and therefore he doesn't give a shit about Thorin's reservations. As for whether or not it is believable that this map can only be read by Elrond, I'm not entirely sure. But if we accept that Gandalf believes this, then his actions are reasonable. Although I will highlight at this point that I'm still unsure why exactly Gandalf is interested in helping Thorin. Without delving into the actual nature of Gandalf from the source material and sticking purely to the films, whether Gandalf is some kind of immortal demigod orchestrating grand plans that affect the fabric of reality, or if he's just an old and powerful magic wielder, 
His motivation for being involved in Frodo's quest to destroy the ring was that there was a very real threat that Sauron would return if he does not aid them. Gandalf does not want Sauron to take over Middle-earth. In The Hobbit, however, until we get some elaboration later, it remains unclear what stake Gandalf actually has in helping Thorin. If Thorin is unsuccessful in retaking Erebor, then nothing actually changes. It just means that the dwarves remain living in the Blue Mountains where they had migrated to, rather than living in Erebor. There are breadcrumbs that I think are sufficient to explain this, but because the film never addresses this, it inevitably remains unclear. Gandalf had some kind of relationship with Thorin's grandfather King Thror, as the king gave Gandalf the map and key to pass down to Thorin. Additionally, we know that Gandalf is a good person who fights evil and wants to protect Middle-earth. That is sufficient, but it's still odd that no character ever questions his involvement. Anyway, the party enters Rivendell, and they are greeted by Brett Mackenzie, who tells Gandalf that he heard of their arrival in the valley. Because, at times, this movie attempts to hold on to some semblance of reality, they are not greeted by the one character that they needed to speak to because Rivendell is not a film set, it is a town and it is inhabited by more than one person. Take note, Rings of Power. Brett Mackenzie tells Gandalf that Elrond is not here, and then it is revealed that Elrond was leading the soldiers who dispatched the wargs earlier, as we see the elves returning on their horses. How exactly Brett Mackenzie had heard that the dwarves had entered the valley is unknown, particularly because the dwarves managed to arrive before Elrond had a chance to tell anyone about them. Anyway, seeing the elven soldiers approaching them, Thorin has the dwarves close ranks to defend themselves. This makes sense, and I totally believe that Thorin would do this, However, I dislike how the movie is forcing Thorin into this situation by having Elrond and his soldiers arrive dramatically by riding straight towards them. After intimidating the dwarves for no good reason other than, I guess, Elrond wants to be a dick, he then greets Gandalf and then greets Thorin. Welcome, Thorin, son of Thrain. I do not believe we have met. You have your grandfather's bearing. A new Thor when he ruled under the mountain. Indeed. He made no mention of you. And then Elrond responds in Elvish, and we do not get any subtitles to tell us what he is saying. The reason for this is because this is the setup for a joke. Does he offer us insult? No, Master Glond, he's offering you food. Oh, okay, but why would he offer food in Elvish when the dwarves don't speak? Ah, uh, uh, well, in that case, lead on. All right, okay, so that was quick. The dwarves now trust the elves enough to eat their food. Also, I have no idea why Gloin is the one making this call when Thorin is clearly extremely suspicious of the elves. I can only assume that this is so as to allow the elves into Rivendell without having Thorin explicitly okay it. Anyway, this next part I find rather amusing as it very clearly depicts the cultural differences between the elves and the dwarves. And then it just keeps going and going and getting more and more absurd. So Dwalin, the most rugged and intimidating of the dwarves, is presented with a bowl of salad and frustratedly exclaims, Where's the meat? This is certainly a chuckle-worthy line that also serves a purpose in the story. Unfortunately, we then get two further lines from Ori that serve exactly the same purpose and further reinforce him as being a character that I cannot take seriously. Try it. Just a mouthful. I don't like green food. Have they got any chips? Jokes aside, there is very obviously something wrong with Ori. This isn't me being an edgy YouTuber, there is simply no other way to read him. He behaves as if he is about five years old. And I'm sorry, but Thorin's line earlier? I will take each and every one of these dwarves over an army from the Iron Hills, for when I called upon them, they answered. Does not go anywhere near far enough to explain why the hell he has decided to take a toddler on a dangerous and important quest. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, we then see Keeley flirting with an elf before telling Dwalin that. I can't say a fancy elf makes myself. Too thin. Not some facial hair for me. Firstly, how dare you objectify women in this way? You aren't allowed to speak about a woman's physicality in 2023. Oh, wait, yeah, this came out in the before times. In the long, long ago, when people were allowed to act like people instead of like terrified mice tiptoeing around on the eggshells of social media and cancel culture. Secondly, Keeley says that he prefers women with a bit of meat on them and some facial hair, which, as seen earlier in the movie, is what dwarf women look like. Given this fact, it makes the decision to have Keeley look like he just lost a walk-off to Derek Zoolander seem even more jarring because of the way he talks about dwarven beauty standards. Anyway, then he comments, Bob, that one there's not bad. That's not an elf, mate. <laughs> Remember, children, it was not that long ago when massive blockbuster movies were allowed to make these kinds of jokes. As for whether this joke is a good one, this is another question. 
I can somewhat buy the idea that Keeley, who is evidently inexperienced with elves, may confuse at a glance an elf male from an elf female. They are both tall, thin, beardless, and have long hair. However, Keeley has also just said that he doesn't find tall, thin, beardless women to be attractive, so why he says this elfman is not bad is pretty confusing. Anyway, the dwarves then all laugh at Keeley, who is embarrassed about outing himself as a homosexual. Nothing like a good laugh at someone else's expense. Good for building character. And because this version of Keeley was written in the late 2000s, Keeley does not cry about it on Twitter and then neck a bottle of bleach. Moving swiftly on, we see Elrond telling Thorin about the sword that he found in the troll cave. Forged by the high elves of the west. It serve you well. Thorin accepts Elrond's words, but does not respond. Elrond then asks Gandalf why they were on the Great East Road, prompting Thorin to leave, presumably because he does not want to discuss the nature of their quest with Elrond. Then, because we need more comedy, we get this. No surprising the culture. These are the descendants of the House of Durin. The noble teach them folk. Change the tune, why don't you? I feel like I'm at a funeral. Uh, there's only one thing for it. In there's an in, there's a merry old man. <laughs> oh, the ostler has <laughs> no purring of sawing in the middle. <laughs> so. You see, it is funny because the dwarves act in exactly the opposite way to how Gandalf just described them. The problem I have with this is that even though dwarves are brash, loud, and rude, this does not and should not mean that they act in this way in all places and at all times. Elrond has gone out of his way to accommodate them. He has given them food and he has provided entertainment in the form of music. Given that the dwarves are loud and inconsiderate and very much fish out of water in experiencing elven culture for presumably the first time, I can totally accept them complaining that the food doesn't contain enough meat. I can also totally understand them finding the music to be boring. I have far more of a hard time accepting that they consider it acceptable to start pelting food everywhere and jeering like they're at a pub. Yes, I know that they behaved in exactly this way earlier in the film when they were in Bilbo's dining room, but my assumption was that these were characters, not caricatures. In Bilbo's dining room, they had been told that there would be lots of food for them by Gandalf, and they were also all meeting up for the first time before starting their quest, hence their raucous behavior. Here in Rivendell, Elrond has been an extremely welcoming and gracious host, and their response is to throw food all over the floor and at their statues. The one part of this, however, that I do like is that the dwarves have been seated at what appear to be children's tables, as regular tables would of course be far too large. Okay, so Gloin really likes food. Elrond can be a dick, is diplomatic and polite, and is welcoming and generous. Thorin doesn't care if he offends Elrond. Dwalin does not abide soil food. Keeley thinks he is a ladies' man, but is insecure about his romantic disposition. Cut to later that evening, where Thorin, Balin, Gandalf, Bilbo, and Elrond are all discussing the map. This next part, unfortunately, very much reminds me of many of the interactions in Rings of Power. Thorin states that, Our business is no concern of elves. It is the legacy of my people. It is mine to protect, as are its secrets. This is all very consistent with his beliefs. However, the reason why this feels very artificial and unnatural is because we are expected to believe that prior to this scene starting, Gandalf asked Thorin and Elrond to come with him and have a chat. Why he also asked Bilbo and Balin, I have no idea, but I digress. Upon being pulled aside by Gandalf and told to bring the map with him, we have to believe that at no point prior to standing in front of Elrond did Thorin voice any kind of objection to this. He waited until they were all standing in the same room because that is where the scene begins and that is when the camera starts rolling. This is a small problem, admittedly, but a problem nonetheless. The other question that this scene raises is to what degree is it realistic that Thorin would reject assistance from elves if it would aid in his quest to retake Erebor? As depicted, this scene suggests that Thorin's dislike and distrust of elves in general, because remember he has no history with Elrond, outweighs his desire to retake Erebor and return the dwarves to their rightful home. The only thing we can assume is that Thorin does not believe Gandalf when he claims that Elrond can help them, or that Thorin is unwilling to risk it and would rather look anywhere else for help than seek assistance from an elf. This all makes sense given his history, and it lays out very clearly what his priorities are. Let's see if they change, and if they do, what causes them to. 
Anyway, once again, Gandalf is frustrated by Thorin's stubbornness. Save me from the stubbornness of dwarves. You stand here in the presence of one of the few in Middle-earth who can read that map. Show it to Lord Elrond. So, what happens next is rather confused. Upon hearing Gandalf reiterate that Elrond can help, for the third time, Thorin decides that, actually, you know what, he will trust Elrond. Suggesting that the only reason he said, Our business is no concern of elves. It is the legacy of my people. It is mine to protect, as are its secrets. Was to remind the audience of his view of elves. The writers have spent a lot of time establishing Thorin's perception of elves and explaining why he feels this way. And yet, with a nudge from Gandalf, he is willing to trust Elrond. Alrighty then. The other part of this that is confused is that Balin attempts to stop him. Thorin, no. Suggesting, from out of goddamn nowhere, that Balin hates elves even more than Thorin. I would argue that what would have made vastly more sense, and what would have been built on what we already know of these characters, would be to have Thorin be absolutely steadfast against showing Elrond the map, establishing that he will not trust Elrond even though Gandalf has vouched for him. Then, have Balin, whom Thorin appears to have known for the longest, and has the closest kinship with, convince Thorin to ask Elrond for help by reminding him that Elrond has just provided food and shelter for him and their entire party. I assume that the reason why they did not do this is because Thorin is one of the main characters, so he has to be the one with the agency. So, Elrond looks at the map and immediately asks, Erebor, what is your interest in this map? And before Thorin can respond, Gandalf conceals their true intentions by saying that it is mostly academic. Elrond observes the presence of moon runes on the map. Kirth Ethel. Moon runes? Of course. The moon runes can only be read by the light of a moon of the same shape and season as the day on which they were written. Oh, okay, so what you're saying is that if lunar patterns function in the same way in Middle-earth as they do in reality, then the dwarves have a 1 in 365 chance of today being the day that the runes can be read. I wonder if today is that day- Of course it fucking is! Fate is with you, Tharun Oakenshield. Okay, so then things unfortunately get even messier. Elrond reads the runes and they say, Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. So, because Bilbo is here for absolutely no reason, Gandalf is able to explain to him and the audience what Durin's day is. This is entirely unjustified, but it is a minor issue given what else happens in this scene. Thorin says that Durin's day will soon be upon them, establishing a ticking clock element to their quest unless, of course, they wait until the following year. Balin then says that they still have time to find the entrance. We have to be standing in exactly the right spot at exactly the right time. Then, and only then, can the door be opened. Establishing that timing is critical and therefore establishing tension for when they reach Erebor. Evidently, they forgot that Elrond was of course still standing right fucking there and they have just revealed their true intentions to him. Despite the fact that Thorin still has extreme reservations about Elrond, and Balin evidently even more so. Elrond's response to this revelation is that some would not deem their quest wise. Whom he is referring to, we will find out later. Okay, so Balin despises elves. I'm gonna put that in a question mark because there are other potential explanations for his reaction. Elrond is wise and is willing to help, and Gandalf is manipulative. Cut to Weathertop. Why? Where evil is doing evil because of course evil is. Two of the orcs have returned to their master, whom as absolutely no one saw coming, is Azog. Accompanied, of course, by his gigantic white anime wolf with glowing eyes. Remember when animals in Middle-earth were animals with some semblance of realism? Oh well. Gone are the days of yore. So the orc tells Azog that they lost the dwarves after being ambushed by elves. Because Azog is a fantastic villain, he says exactly what he's thinking with no metaphor, no double meaning, no eloquence. He simply says, Me no want excuses, me want head of dwarf king. Which the orcs and the audience already know. The orc continues, saying that they were outnumbered and that he barely escaped with his life. He, of course, does not mention Radagast and his Ramadan rabbits, even though this would likely be useful information to Azog and information that would potentially excuse his failure. Because Azog is the most villainous villain to ever villain, he feeds the orc to his wags. <laughs> when are you goody goody fools going to understand? I am completely and utterly evil. Character writing, folks. 
He then continues to the remaining orcs that the dwarf scum will show themselves soon and that they should send out word that there is a price on their heads. And that is the scene. What in the goddamned hell was the point of this scene? Well, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I'm here for, I guess, so I'll try my best. The purpose of this scene is to remind the audience of the impending threat that the orcs pose to the dwarves. It establishes to the audience, concretely, that Azog is very much alive. Although this was previously hinted at twice already, and if this was not done now, it would have necessarily been done in a later scene when Azog finally reveals himself to Thorin. It also provides a chance to cut away from Rivendell for a bit of variety. That's it. There is no narrative or character purpose for this scene. This scene exists entirely to deliver information to the audience. We learn that Azog is very evil, and that he is hunting the dwarves. Both of which we already knew, meaning that no character, nor us as the audience, actually learns anything from this scene. And the way it ends is laughable, with Azog telling the orcs to send out word that there is a price on the dwarves' heads, suggesting that he had not already done this and that he was waiting until later in the movie to actually try and capture and or kill the dwarves. Okay, Azog is a baddie. Cut back to Rivendell, where I guess the plot of the movie is actually happening? Nah, I guess not. Remember the Lord of the Rings, where characters just kind of wandered aimlessly around Rivendell? Because that's what this is. Remember Narsil? Remember Sauron? Remember this set? Done? Fine. Good. Well done. You have money. You have the rights to use this imagery. Please, let's keep going. Don't waste my motherfucking time! After having Bilbo wander around Rivendell for a bit longer because we sure as shit gotta bloat the living heck out of this runtime, Elrond approaches him asking why he is not with the dwarves. Bilbo responds saying that they won't miss him and confides in Elrond that most of the dwarves don't think he should be with them on this journey. Presumably, forgetting that he saved their lives from the trolls. Anyway, the outcome of this scene is that Elrond welcomes Bilbo to stay in Rivendell if he decides not to continue with the dwarves. This makes sense for Elrond, and it also provides Bilbo with another chance to turn back and refuse the call to adventure. I don't particularly mind this, although it is once again simply reiterating what we have already seen. Bilbo is given the exact same choice he has been given twice before, leading me to conclude that this scene is also entirely pointless. Although I very much enjoy Hugo Weaving's Elrond and Martin Freeman's Bilbo, you have to do more than put those actors on screen for the scene to be justified. Anyway, we then see Brett McKenzie telling Elrond that the dwarves are eating an ungodly amount of food and that they have nearly run out of wine, and he then asks how much longer they will remain in Rivendell. And the two are shocked to discover... I, I am almost speechless. I guess now I know what I'll be discussing with my therapist when I'm in my 60s. So what was the point of this? Well, it shows that the dwarves are incompatible with elven culture. They have different standards of behavior and decency. Cool. Except this was already firmly established multiple times in a previous scene, making this the third goddamn scene in a row that is entirely pointless. Then we cut to Bilbo dropping eaves on Gandalf discussing the quest with Elrond. Elrond suggests that the risk of waking Smaug is too high, and Gandalf responds, If the dwarves take back the mountain, our defenses in the east will be strengthened. Okay, so this gives us a potential reason as to why Gandalf is helping Thorin. He wants to strengthen their defenses in the east. Why he wants to do this is unknown at this point, unless he is suspecting that a certain hobbit might be about to find a certain ring. And we see that Thorin is also dropping eaves. So we, Bilbo, and Thorin all learn that Elrond fears the strain of madness that runs in Thorin's family. His grandfather lost his mind. His father succumbed to the same sickness. Can you swear Thorin Oakenshield will not also fall? This is clearly setting up the idea that Thorin might also be a crazy person because his father and grandfather were crazy people. Except that… no. In the prologue, Bilbo told us that King Thor became infatuated with the massive amount of gold that he had accumulated, and referred to it as a sickness of the mind. Then, after Smaug took Erebor, he was evidently totally fine as he continued to lead the dwarves until his death at the hands of Azog. Maybe King Thor was genuinely afflicted by some kind of mental sickness, magical or otherwise, but firstly it was evidently temporary. And secondly, I am unsure as to how Elrond could have known about it. The sickness developed after the dwarves cut ties with Thranduil, so with no other potential explanation I'm very tempted to call this a plot error. We also learned that Thorin's father Thrain was driven mad with grief after Thror was killed by Azog. Exactly why and how is never explained, but I'm more than willing to accept that Thrain could have been driven mad after losing his father. Meaning that Elrond is drawing on two points of evidence that are sketchy at best, to suggest that Thorin may also have the crazies. And I'm sure this will lead to absolutely nothing in a future movie. 
Okay, so Gandalf wants to help the dwarves because it will strengthen Middle Earth's defenses. And Elrond is worried about Smaug being released and about Thorin having the crazies. And Thorin might have the crazies. So Gandalf tells Elrond that the dwarves will continue their mission with or without their aid, saying that Thorin believes he is answerable to no one and that neither is he. It is not me you must answer to. No! God, please, no! 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 All right, so Galadriel is here, as is Saruman, and it is implied that they have stern words for Gandalf as they feel allowing the dwarves to continue their quest is unwise. How they knew to be here and how they got here in order to speak to Gandalf is either a gigantic convenience or we hand wave it because Saruman and Galadriel are incredibly powerful. Being omniscient and being able to teleport, however, are not in their toolkit as far as I am aware, so I have to assume that this is a convenience. Anyway, that's the setup for this absolute chonker of a scene, so let's see what happens. Gandalf has been worried about Smaug for some time, and he's been trying to find a way to defeat him. The reason why he wants to do this is that he fears Smaug may side with the enemy, meaning Sauron, which would of course have devastating consequences. Okay, problem number one. Gandalf didn't know anything about the necromancer slash Sauron until after the dwarves had already begun their quest. Problem number two. The dwarves' quest does not directly involve any method for actually disposing of Smaug. If Gandalf's goal is to defeat Smaug, he must surely know that 13 dwarves is not anything approaching adequate. Continuing with the scene, Saruman and Galadriel have been observing Gandalf's scheming from a distance and have only now decided to do anything about it. Saruman says, quite rightly, that Sauron is vanquished and so any threat that Smaug poses is entirely constrained to Smaug's own desires. Gandalf believes that there is a reason to be worried, however, as the last of the seven dwarf rings has apparently vanished along with its bearer. Thrain, Thorin's father. As Saruman rightly says, without the One Ring, which at this point is in the possession of Gollum, but these characters all believe it to be lost, the other Rings of Power are all useless to the enemy, which is not how Rings of Power work as far as we are aware from the Lord of the Rings. The One Ring controls and or corrupts the others, meaning that the Dwarf Rings suspiciously disappearing does not point towards Sauron's potential return. So Gandalf reveals that Radagast told him of a necromancer living in Dol Guldur, Saruman rejects this because necromancy is impossible, and also because he considers Radagast to be a fool who eats too many mushrooms. To prove that what he is saying is true, Gandalf reveals the blade given to him by Radagast. Elrond and Galadriel identify it as a Morgul blade made for the Witch King of Angmar, and Galadriel says that it was buried alongside him. We learn that the Witch King was buried super super deep, and that the tomb was protected by powerful magic, meaning that, as far as they are aware, the tomb cannot be opened. The presence of this blade means that even if they do not trust Radagast as a reliable source, at the very least there is some kind of powerful dark magic at work. There is no other way for the Witch King's sword to be here. Because Saruman wasn't listening, he asks what proof they have that the blade came from the Witch King's grave. And Gandalf responds that he has none. Even though Galadriel has already identified it as the Witch King's blade, and presumably there is only one of them, otherwise she could not have concluded this. So Saruman, unsatisfied by everything Gandalf has presented him with, gives an overview of what they actually know. An orc pack was seen and defeated nearby. An old dagger has been found. And a human sorcerer, calling himself the Necromancer, is living in a ruined fortress. Saruman does not consider this to be any cause for concern, probably because he's missing out the part where the blade belonging to Sauron's right-hand man has been found in Dol Guldur after Radagast was attacked by a spectre. Saruman is, however, very troubled by the dwarves' quest, saying that he feels he cannot condone it. Why he feels this way, I have absolutely no idea. There are two potential explanations for Saruman's behavior. Either he is already in contact with the necromancer slash Sauron, he has already betrayed his friends and is therefore trying to cover everything up. The problem with this is that what he says doesn't make sense and no one acknowledges this. Alternatively, Saruman is not evil yet, and he is simply not listening to what anyone else is saying. Saruman's objections during this scene have been to Gandalf's suggestions that Sauron, or at the very least some kind of evil, may still be out there. Evil does not sleep, Elrond. Whether or not Gandalf is right should have absolutely no bearing on Saruman's opinion of the dwarves and their quest. 
Anyway, Galadriel then speaks to Gandalf telepathically, saying that the dwarves are leaving right at this very moment, and that Gandalf knew they were doing this. Immediately afterwards, Brett Mackenzie arrives to tell Elrond that the dwarves have gone. So, although I love seeing Kate Blanchett and Christopher Lee playing their characters again, this scene is a boiling pot of bad ideas and abject nonsense. To summarize it as concisely as I can, Elrond brought Gandalf to Galadriel and Saruman to explain his actions. Gandalf is worried that Sauron is returning or has already returned, and that the threat of Smaug joining Sauron is too great to ignore. This doesn't make sense because, as I said, he did not know of Sauron when he orchestrated the dwarves' quest. Saruman objects to the idea that Sauron has returned because he doesn't listen to what anyone says. He also objects to the dwarves and their quest for reasons that are not explained whatsoever. Galadriel seems to simply listen but not actually add anything to the conversation herself, meaning that the purpose of this scene was, supposedly, to establish why Gandalf is doing what he is doing, elaborate on the Radagast plotline with Dol Guldur and the Necromancer, and of course to give us a scene with characters that the audience remembers. The problem is that the explanation as to Gandalf's motivation is nonsensical. The Radagast plotline with the Necromancer is only here to tie it in with the Lord of the Rings and to bloat the Hobbit into three movies, meaning that the only takeaway from this scene is, oh look, it's Kate Blanchett and Christopher Lee. This scene, if we include the prior conversation with Elrond, also tries to establish multiple reasons as to why the dwarves should not try to retake Erebor. The reasons stated are as follows. Thorin might be crazy. The risk of waking Smaug is too high. And the risk of Smaug allying with Sauron is too high. It took nearly ten minutes of screen time to present these three objections to the dwarves' quest, and only one of them is in any way coherent. Okay, Saruman speaks but doesn't listen. And Galadriel listens but does not speak. So, having now spent 25 minutes in Rivendell, I shit you not, we are allowed to leave and continue the story. So, the dwarves have left with Bilbo, leaving Gandalf behind. Saruman does not make any further attempts to stop the dwarves from going, he just tells Gandalf that he's been a naughty naughty boy, and then lets him go, suggesting that he maybe didn't have any objections to Thorin retaking Erebor, which is probably why the script didn't have him actually voice any. Oh well. So Bilbo takes a longing look at Rivendell, presumably recalling Elrond's offer, but decides to continue with the dwarves. And then we're, well, we're right back in Rivendell because of course we fucking are. I never thought I'd say this, but I am getting sick of Rivendell, and I hate that this movie has inspired this feeling. So Galadriel tells Gandalf that he is right to help Thorin, but she fears that the quest has set in motion forces they do not understand. I assume that she is referring to the whole necromancer thing, which again has absolutely nothing to do with their quest. Radagast just kind of found an evil sword and then told Gandalf, hey, look what I found. Anyway, Galadriel asks Gandalf why he brought Bilbo. I found it as the small things. Everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keeps the darkness at bay. Perhaps it is because I'm afraid. But it gives me courage. Whilst this is certainly a nice thought, it doesn't really hold any water in terms of practicality for obvious reasons. Galadriel tells Gandalf that he should not be afraid, and that she will help him if he ever needs her to, before she evaporates. We then get our travelling montage, accompanied by some more of Howard Shaw's fantastic music and some rather beautiful geography. Stuff like this is the stuff that feels the most Lord of the Ringsy, far more so than dangling actors in front of the camera, primarily because there is no character information within this montage. This is simply an indicator as to the passage of time, presented beautifully with visuals and music. Given what happens next, I'm going to consider this to be the deep breath before the plunge, because we are about to be bombarded by absolute moronic absurdity. After finding themselves on an impossibly steep cliff edge, Bilbo trips and nearly falls off. Okay, this is totally believable and makes sense for the character. He is of course way out of his comfort zone, and he is in a very perilous environment. And then, this happens. So apart from the obvious visual similarities between this and the Caradhras scene in Fellowship, what in the holy hell just happened? Well, you see, it's a thunder battle. This is no thunderstorm, it's a thunder battle! What? Unfortunately, the ledge where the dwarves were standing turns out to be part of a gigantic rock monster, a living mountain, and we are treated to the second video game sequence of the movie.
I have nothing to say here, really. There isn't any character information to speak of, and all I can really say is that there is no way in hell that any of them survive this. The world contorts so as to not have anyone die. As for why the mountains came alive and started having a rumble at the very moment when our main characters are crossing them, I have absolutely no idea. I guess this kind of thing can just happen now. Anyway, we do afterwards get a small amount of character information. Boffer realizes that Bilbo is not with them, and they see that he is hanging off the ledge. <laughs> the dwarves all collectively chip in and pull Bilbo back up. So, this marks the third time when Bilbo has nearly been killed, however in none of these instances was it in any way his fault. Setting aside for a moment the fact that many if not all of the dwarves should have died in this scene, Thorin appears to be frustrated with Bilbo because he keeps endangering himself and them, seemingly forgetting that the goddamn mountain they were just climbing literally came alive and started punching other mountains. But the desired result of this scene is to reinforce that Thorin considers Bilbo to be a liability. So this is what happens. The thing is, right before the absurd cartoon mountain fight sequence, Bilbo already slipped and nearly fell off the mountain, meaning that you literally could have cut the thunder battle and the scene remains entirely intact from a character perspective. Thorin would reasonably be pissed off that Bilbo keeps endangering himself and the dwarves by not paying enough attention to where he is going. But instead, we gotta have a giant living mountain smackdown because… shut up, we just do. So the dwarves find a cave on the mountain, and I am unsure as to what part of the living mountain's anatomy this is, and they rest for the night. Balin reminds Thorin that the plan was to wait in the mountains for Gandalf, and Thorin indicates that he has altered the plan. Pray I don't alter it any further. And this deal's getting worse all the time. Here is a unicycle. Evidently no longer wanting Gandalf's help. Elsewhere, Azog has found their scent and is following the dwarves into the mountain pass. Cool. Okay, now that's done, we return to the cave where everyone is sleeping. Bilbo wakes and starts packing his things to leave and return, presumably, to Rivendell. This means that after encountering living mountains, nearly falling to his death twice, and having Thorin tell him not for the first time that he is a liability and that he should not be here, Bilbo has decided that Thorin is correct and that he should go home. Small problem, they are now presumably days away from Rivendell. The safest place Bilbo can be is very likely right where he is now. Anyway, Boffer notices Bilbo leaving and encourages him to stay. He can't turn back now, eh? You're part of the company. You're one of us. Not now, am I? Thorin said I should never have come and he was right. I don't know what I was thinking. Should never have run out my door. So, ignoring the setup, I really like this dialogue exchange. At least until the ending destroys it. You're homesick. I understand. No, you don't. You don't understand. None of you do. You're dwarves. You're used to, to, to this life. Never settling in one place, not belonging anywhere. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. <clears throat> no, you're right. We don't belong anywhere. Bilbo realizes what he has just said and appears to acknowledge that he understands why the dwarves are so driven to retake Erebor. However, this does not change Bilbo's perception that he does not belong with them. Importantly, Thorin has been listening to all of this and does not intervene, suggesting that he is content with Bilbo's decision to leave. So Boffer then wishes Bilbo well, and Bilbo departs. Except that, sorry Bilbo, the script has other plans for you, then the floor opens up and they all fall down hundreds of feet and miraculously survive. Because this movie is a cartoon. This also means that Bilbo's intentions at this point were to leave, and the movie made there be a hole so that he couldn't. Middle-earth is effectively forcing Bilbo to continue on the quest. He did not decide, after speaking to Boffer, that he actually should help them. The script instead prevented him from leaving. This is a crystal clear moment of the plot driving the characters, rather than the characters driving the plot. Okay, so Bilbo wants to return home, feels out of his depth, and feels he does not belong with the dwarves. And Thorin thinks Bilbo is at fault for nearly dying as a result of a mountain coming alive. And Gandalf likes using Bilbo because it makes him feel brave. So Thorin and company have accidentally led into a goblin cave and for some reason the goblins don't immediately do what goblins do and, you know, kill them. They instead take them to their leader. And it certainly is a good thing they didn't want to kill the dwarves because, for the second time in their journey, they are now at the mercy of unintelligent yet dangerous and evil monsters. 
Anyway, because the film tries to convince us that being unfamiliar with hobbits means that Bilbo can literally just stop moving and the goblins will totally just forget that he exists, Bilbo literally stops moving and the orcs totally just forget that he exists. What? There's a word for this, and that word is no. Sorry, I don't buy this for one second. Even if the goblins are colossally unintelligent, there is an entire horde of them, and they know he is there. I guess this is building on the idea that Bilbo is super small and unassuming and therefore has a superpower? Except, need I remind you, Bilbo is barely smaller than the dwarves. To a goblin, he probably looks exactly like a dwarf. Anyway, Bilbo becomes invisible without becoming invisible, and he slinks off into the shadows. So, what has happened in the last five minutes is that the script has refused to allow Bilbo to leave the dwarves and go home, despite him wanting to do precisely that, and it has now forced him into a situation whereby he has to rescue the aforementioned dwarves from the goblins. Escape is not an option, and Bilbo's moral compass will not allow him to abandon the dwarves if they need his help. Fantastic storytelling. Anyway, a goblin sees Bilbo and attacks him, forcing him to defend himself. I like that Bilbo is unable to defeat the goblin in combat, however, I dislike the fact that the film shows him trading blows effectively with the goblin, when this is the first time he has ever wielded a sword in combat. Also, once again, we have characters falling ridiculous distances and being absolutely fine. Why would I care about the potential threat of Gollum smashing Bilbo's skull with a rock if he can survive this? <laughs> Meanwhile, the dwarves are brought deep into Goblin Town and are presented to the Goblin King, who appears to be an extremely flamboyant and incredibly overweight cartoon comedian, complete with jiggle physics, who sings to the dwarves as they approach. This kind of thing may have worked in the book, but this is another instance of thematic dissonance caused by adapting a children's novel into an epic fantasy adventure that we are supposed to take to any degree seriously. Maybe I'm being too harsh, but I definitely preferred the goblins in The Lord of the Rings that were little more than violent monsters over these singing and dancing and utterly non-threatening weirdos. Down, down, down in goblin town. Down, down, down in goblin town. If these were not goblins, but gobloids, and thus distinct from the creatures that have already been established to exist in this world, then I would have far less of an issue with this creative decision. Anyway, after asking what they thought of his song, because I guess this is the funny part of the movie, he asks who the dwarves are and why they came into his kingdom. One of the goblins informs him that they are dwarves whom they found on the front porch. Um, no. What happened is that they fell asleep in a cave and then, after presumably a few hours, the floor gave way, revealing that it was some kind of booby trap, or at least that's what I assumed. There is no way that this is the actual entrance that the goblins used to get in and out of their underground kingdom. Anyway, the Goblin King has the dwarves searched, and it is revealed that Nori had stolen a substantial amount of cutlery and glassware from the elves. Ah, okay, so just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, it gets fucking worse. The dwarves are flat out assholes. Elrond helped them, the elves helped them, and in response the dwarves acted like children, threw food everywhere, had naked wrestling matches in a fountain, and stole their cutlery. Anyway, the goblins believe that the dwarves are in league with the elves as a result of seeing the elven cutlery. Yes, this is a plot point in the movie. And then this happens. Made in Rivendell. Second age. Couldn't give it away. <sighs> and then, as if the previous five minutes or so could have been skipped entirely, the Goblin King asks what they are doing in these parts. Your boys flatten my trumpet. I'll flatten more than your trumpet. We were on the road. Well, it's not so much a road as a path. Actually, it's not even that, come to think of it. It's more like a track. Anyway, the point is, we were on this road like a path, like a track. And then we went. Which is a problem, because we were supposed to be in Dunland last Tuesday. Not Again, because this is the funny part, we get funnies. Or at least the film structures these exchanges as if they are funnies. I'm going to skip over them because I really can't take much more of this and because this video is already ginormous. What I will say though is that none of the dwarves seem to have any awareness as to the danger they are in. They are all about to be tortured and killed and no one gives a shit. Either because they're all acting in front of a green screen and they are not surrounded by monsters, or because consequences don't matter when we have studio mandated funnies to deliver. Anyway, once it's time for the plot to get moving again, Thorin reveals himself to the Goblin King, who recognizes him. And then it is revealed that the Goblin King had received word that Azog was willing to pay for Thorin's head. Okay, so I have no issue with word traveling through the Orc Vine and into the Goblin King's lair. What I take tremendous issue with is the fact that the Goblin King has a very clear and obvious motivation to kill them all immediately. And instead of doing this, he explains to Thorin who Azog is, 
and thus reveals that Azog is still alive, and then he tells this little deformed spastic goofball to send word back to Azog to inform him that Thorin has been captured, instead of, you know, killing him. Like he literally just said he should do. On the plus side though, look at this little guy, he's just so happy being evil. So Nori is a thieving asshole. The Goblin King acts contrary to what his motivations would suggest. Bilbo can become invisible, and the goblins can't see him if he doesn't move. So this next part of the movie features two scenes that are intercut with each other. One is excellent, and one is terrible. So rather than try and tackle them in real time chronologically, I'm gonna go with the riddles sequence first, and then I will give a good spanking to the escape from Goblin Town. Cut to Bilbo waking up after having fallen a great distance into the cave. He notices the goblin that attacked him has also fallen, that it is still alive, but that it is immobilized and seriously injured. Enter Gollum. So Gollum approaches the goblin and clearly intends to eat it. After a brief scuffle, he bashes the goblin's skull with a rock and drags him away. During the scuffle, however, a certain ring dropped out of Gollum's pocketses. It is dramatically convenient that Bilbo landed on squidgy mushrooms whereas the goblin landed flat on its spine, otherwise none of the Lord of the Rings happens. Gollum eats Bilbo, who can't possibly fight back, and the story ends. Oh well. So Bilbo notices the ring, thinking nothing of it, and puts it in his pocket. He approaches Gollum, who is in the process of bludgeoning the goblin's corpse in order to eat it. I am unsure why exactly he approaches Gollum, we simply have to assume that there was no alternative way out of the cave other than to head towards the deranged creature that has just beaten a goblin to death in order to consume it. Anyway, Gollum finds Bilbo and appears to want to eat him too. Yes, and splashes, precious. That's a meaty mouthful. Anyway, Bilbo asks Gollum how to get out whilst fighting off Gollum's attempts to eat him. After some rather entertaining Gollumisms, courtesy of the fantastic Andy Circus, We know safe paths for horses. Safe paths in the dark. Shut up! Gollum tells Bilbo a riddle. Afterwards, the scene uses Gollum's multiple personalities to effectively add tension to the scene, as Smeagol wants to play riddles, whereas Gollum wants to eat Bilbo. Don't do it again, I ask us. No! No more riddles. Finish him off. Finish him now. This is consistent with the kind of thing we saw from Gollum in The Lord of the Rings, and it is a very effective way to dial up the tension. Upon understanding a little more about Gollum's multiple personalities and how he can diplomatically play the situation, Bilbo decides to challenge Gollum to a game of riddles. If Bilbo wins, Gollum shows him the way out. If Gollum wins... If Baggins loses, we eat it whole. Fair enough. Alright, the stakes are very clear. Both sides are motivated to win, and Bilbo is going to have to outsmart Gollum in order to escape. As they start, Bilbo sheaths his sword, either as a show of good faith or because he is overly trusting, and the camera lingers on a curious glance from Gollum. So the two exchange riddles whilst Gollum attempts to manoeuvre himself closer to Bilbo. We also get some comedy that actually works, probably because it is built upon the characters in question rather than contradicting them. Oh. Oh. Wieners. Wieners. Shut up. As Gollum gets increasingly frustrated, we see him pick up a rock, displaying his intent to skull Bilbo. Because Gollum slips up during their game, Bilbo uses this to ask Gollum an unfair question, which Gollum accepts, provided he gets three guesses. Although he only holds up two fingers when he says this, meaning that we can add the concept of three to the list of things he has forgotten. Anyway, Bilbo's question is... What have I got in my pocket? Gollum, of course, loses, and Bilbo asks him to show him the way out. Gollum then asks... What has he got? It's Parkinson's. And Gollum then realizes that his precious is lost. After throwing a tantrum, Gollum again asks, What has he got? It's nasty little Parkinson's. Having realized that Bilbo may well have stolen it. So, Gollum's personification in this scene, I think, is excellent. It feels like the same Gollum from The Lord of the Rings. We get some direct references to The Lord of the Rings, but these are handled properly and they make sense. 
Familiar visual cues, such as Gollum talking to his own reflection, and direct lines such as STOLE IT! make perfect sense given the scene in question. So, Bilbo flees Gollum, and he falls over and the ring lands on his finger, granting him invisibility. You could call this ridiculously lucky, but as we know from The Lord of the Rings, the ring has a will of its own. And this exact thing happens in Fellowship of the Ring, so I don't have an issue given the context. As Bilbo approaches the exit to the cave, he sees Gandalf and the dwarves making their escape. We focus on Gollum, who appears to be terrified and distraught. Bilbo approaches him with his sword drawn, still invisible, and prepares to execute Gollum. In the previous scene where Gandalf handed Sting to Bilbo, he explained that True courage is about knowing not when to take a life, but when to spare one. Which is something that directly informs Bilbo's actions in this scene. I also very much appreciate that the writers had enough faith in their audience having an attention span, so they evidently did not feel the need to overdub Gandalf's line during this scene. So Bilbo takes pity on Gollum and decides not to kill him. He instead leaps over him and escapes. Okay, so this sequence is by no means perfect, however, it is easily the best scene in the movie, and quite possibly the best scene in the trilogy. It features clearly defined characters with clearly defined goals. After the initial setup, everything that happens makes sense given what we know about the characters involved, and the scene is extremely simple and all the better for it. Okay, so Bilbo takes pity on Gollum, is empathetic, is intelligent, and is resourceful. And Gollum is deranged, has split personalities, one hostile and one less so, is somewhat intelligent, is extremely attached to the ring, and has a degree of honor, as he will not cheat. So, intercut with what is likely the best scene in the film, we have probably the worst. In the middle of the game of riddles, we cut back to the giant singing cartoon Goblin. Bones will be shattered, necks will be wrung, you'll be beaten and battered, from wrecks you'll be hung. I mean, this really is just a perfect encapsulation of what is wrong with these movies. We have the best scene in the film that just so happens to be extremely faithful to the source material, and then we interrupt that scene with a silly goblin singing a silly song. This is what I mean when I suggest that there might be a fantastic three-hour movie within this trilogy. Anyway, one of the goblins unsheathes Thorin's sword, Orcrist, for absolutely no reason. Well, I say absolutely no reason, the reason is so that the Goblin King can freak the fuck out and identify it as the Goblin Cleaver. I know that sword! It is the Goblin Cleaver! Which for some reason prompts him to order the goblins to kill the dwarves, which he was already motivated to do. But I guess he didn't want to do so until now because he didn't feel like it? Anyway, so because the dwarves have the goblin cleaver sword, they decide to kill the dwarves. How inconvenient. And then Gandalf is here and he saves them. How convenient. Yes, Gandalf is a wizard, but my understanding was that he had limits to his power. When he rescued the dwarves from the trolls, this was also convenient, but it was at least explicable because we knew he was relatively close by. Him appearing in this underground goblin cave when the dwarves have not seen him for days if not weeks is ridiculous. The only defense for this, which is tenuous, is the line from Balin saying that they were supposed to wait in the mountains for Gandalf, meaning that their arranged meeting spot was in the mountains. How that leads to Gandalf ending up inside this cave, I have absolutely no idea. But he's a wizard, so I, I guess we just, we don't think about it. He can do anything at any point, because what the hell even are stakes anyway? He then tells the dwarves to take up arms and fight, which they do. And because the Goblin King is still there, he tells us all about how scary Gandalf's sword is. He wields the foe hammer, the beater, bright as daylight! This, of course, serves absolutely no function, so why include it? We then get a protracted fight scene, complete with funny decapitations, which is followed by a physics-defying cartoon chase sequence. This all goes on for quite a while, and there is no real character information present within. All I can really say is that this shows the dwarves to all be competent fighters who are occasionally resourceful. We also have this bullshit. Does it, does it count as plot armor if he's using a sword? Anyway, why does this sequence leave me feeling entirely empty inside? I think that it has something to do with the fact that the goblins pose zero threat to the dwarves, the fact that the dwarves are not sustaining any damage whatsoever, 
and the fact that reality seems to be bending itself repeatedly in their favour. All of this results in a sequence which is monotonous, inconsequential, and unjustified. We learn nothing. This is simply a case of look at the pretty colours, or in this case, look at the funny kills. <laughs> Anyway, then the Goblin King pulls a Sadok, having been knocked off the platform before the chase began. He has now managed to teleport in front of the dwarves, which is impossible for many reasons that I feel are self-evident. He gives Gandalf his bad guy line. You thought you could escape me. What are you going to do now, wizard? And Gandalf then slices him with his sword. No! No! <laughs> That'll do it. Because it, it's funny and goofy, guys. You like funny and goofy, don't you? And then Gandalf kills the Goblin King, and then the platform they're standing on falls into the cave in a sequence which utterly defies any semblance of physics or realism. This is a cartoon. And this is a problem because this means that the world that the Lord of the Rings takes place in adheres to cartoon physics. To elaborate on what I mentioned earlier, yes, there are moments of questionable physics within the Lord of the Rings, but these are almost entirely constrained to the character Legolas. It is excusable because he is the only elf present and he is the only one that appears to be able to do these things. That said, had Legolas just fallen down this ravine on this rickety plank of wood and survived, I would call just as much bullshit as I am calling right now. So, having survived the impossible, what could possibly happen next? Well, that could have been worse. I am not going to fucking bother, this is not worth my time. So Gandalf then declares that the only thing that will save them is daylight, which is interesting given that the orcs earlier in the movie did not care about daylight, so maybe this is a retcon that daylight only affects goblins now? Anyway, the dwarves escape into the outside world, and only now does Gandalf realise Bilbo is not with them. I can maybe accept that in all the carnage and chasing and fighting, Gandalf not realising that, say, Biffa was not with them, because who gives a shit about Biffa, but my understanding was that Bilbo was uniquely important to him and yet he did not notice that he was missing. We then hear Dwalin say, Curse that halfling! Now he's lost? I thought he was with Dory! And Thorin claims Bilbo saw his chance and left. Whether or not Thorin actually believes this is irrelevant. The point of this is that Bilbo is given yet another chance to turn back. He is watching and listening whilst invisible, and could simply leave and no one would question it. He has been given a very easy out. Instead, however, he decides to reveal himself. The dwarves have rather disparate responses to this, which I find interesting. Balin, Boffer, Feely, and Keely appear to be very happy to see Bilbo. Thorin appears to be ashamed of what he just said. Dwalin appears to be confused and almost suspicious as to how Bilbo escaped. Thorin then asks, I want to know, why did you come back? So this next part is rather critical to Bilbo's character. The last time we had any insight into what he wanted to do was right before everyone fell into the goblin cave. He was in the process of leaving and Thorin had accepted this. Since then, it appears that his conversation with Boffa as well as his experience with Gollum has made him rethink his priorities. Bilbo replies, and I am paraphrasing, I know you doubt me. I often think of Bag End. I miss my home. That's where I belong. That's why I came back, because you don't have a home it was taken from you, but I will help you take it back if I can. This tells us very clearly that Bilbo is no longer having second thoughts. He has now fully committed to helping the dwarves because he considers it to be the right thing to do. I have no issue with Bilbo making this decision, however I do wish that it had been fleshed out a little more. His experience with Gollum may or may not have informed his decision, we simply don't know. The Gollum sequence, metaphorically or literally, had nothing to do with losing a home or the desire to retake one. It did, however, display Bilbo's empathy towards those who are suffering. This is not a direct parallel, but I think this, plus the conversation with Boffer previously, is enough to inform this decision. Thorin appears to be content with this explanation. We unfortunately don't get any time to let this sink in because of what happens next. Okay, Dwalin has no patience for Bilbo and is a brave and very capable warrior. Thorin does not trust or value Bilbo, does not care for Bilbo's safety, however is reservedly impressed by Bilbo's bravery and commitment. Gandalf is not very perceptive, and Bilbo is committed to helping if he can, and empathizes with the dwarves. So because we need a big action set piece to serve as the climax of the movie, Azog has found the dwarves. 
But Random, didn't we just have a big action set piece? Get out of here, retarded alter ego, you clearly know nothing about storytelling. So, how did Azog know that the dwarves were here? Well, remember, the Goblin King told his little wheelie boy to send word to Azog that Thorin had been captured, which must have happened during their escape from the mountain, and Azog must have been extremely close by in order to intercept them here. Alright, the foundation is barely functional, so let's dive in and see how much of a mess we can make. So, Azog orders his orcs to run the dwarves down and tear them to pieces. The wags charge in, one of them stabs itself in the skull with Bilbo's sword, and another runs into Ori's hammer. Clumsy me. Revealing that although these animals look very threatening, they are in fact retarded, thus diluting the tension. The dwarves run to the edge of the cliff and hide in the trees. They seem to be in a bit of a predicament, but then Gandalf sees a butterfly and you all know exactly where this is going. The writers have written themselves into a corner by having this battle sequence and their way out is to implement the Eagles Save the Day meme. Fantastic. So, the dwarves are sitting in their trees. Luckily, Azog didn't bring any bows, and then Thorin sees Azog and realizes that he is still very much alive. Azog taunts Thorin, saying that he stinks of the same fear that his father smelled of. He tells the orcs to kill everyone, but that Thorin is his. So the giant cartoon dinosaur wolves attack the trees. Incredibly, no one is killed or even injured. And we then get more cartoon physics resulting in everyone being on the same tree, hanging over the edge of the cliff. For the most maximum of maximum drama, of course. So then Gandalf turns fur cones into Molotov cocktails and starts hurling them at the orcs. Why he has this limitation and can't simply squirt fireballs at them is unknown, particularly given all the other overtly magical stuff he has done in this movie. So anyway, as a result of Gandalf's destructive tendencies, they set much of the forest on fire and drive back the wags. The dwarves for some reason cheer, as if they are now victorious, despite them still being very much trapped, and they are presumably unaware that Gandalf has called an uber. Then the maximum drama gets even more maximum because the tree falls over and everyone is hanging off the cliff. At some point, a point that was reached a long time ago in this movie, when you keep putting all your characters in extreme peril only to have them escape with no consequences, the audience is likely to stop caring. Ori and Dory nearly fall to their deaths, only to be saved temporarily by Gandalf. Thorin then stares down Azog and decides to fight him. And I have absolutely no idea why. Azog cannot get to Thorin due to the fire, or at least if he can, he chooses not to, which of course would not really make any sense. Some groundwork has been set. We know why Thorin is highly motivated to kill Azog. What is not established is that Thorin will walk alone towards certain death, Azog plus multiple wags and orcs, whilst his friends and companions are clinging to a tree and about to fall off a cliff. The only reasonable thing that can happen here is that Thorin will be slaughtered for absolutely no reason, and that his friends will all fall to their deaths when he could evidently have saved them. Instead of helping his friends, his priority is to avenge his grandfather by killing Azog. Thorin evidently cares more about killing Azog than he does about keeping his friends alive, defeating Smaug, or retaking Erebor. Well done, ill-fated trilogy. You have destroyed one of your primary characters before the end of the first movie. And for some reason, the soundtrack is playing a section from A Knife in the Dark, which you may know as the Nazgul theme. <laughs> This is an extremely weird choice, and it is absolutely inappropriate. This leitmotif is often used in The Lord of the Rings to convey impending terror as unstoppable evil approaches the heroes. That is not what is happening here. Setting aside Thorin's questionable state of mind, this scene depicts a hero approaching a villain in the name of vengeance. Music has meaning. That is the entire point of music in movies. And here, it is distractingly misused. My guess is that either they added this scene after the score had been composed and so they needed to use a track from elsewhere to fill the gap, or they decided to use this particular piece of music because audiences will remember it? I honestly have no idea, but regardless it was a terrible decision. So Thorin charges Azog who squashes him with his wag. Congratulations you fucking idiot. He then blocks a hit from Azog's gigantic mace using his… well, using his face. And then it gets even worse. Azog's wag picks Thorin up in its mouth, and for the third time in this movie, Thorin is at the mercy of a giant evil monster intent on killing him. Well done, sir, your incompetence is laid bare. So now, because Thorin has acted like a spurg and been punished for it, and because the dwarves are holding on for their lives with no explicable means of escape, this means that we are at the mid action scene low point. The music and cinematography are clearly trying to convey a sense of futile desperation which uh, really doesn't work because of course Thorin literally did this to himself. Regardless, everything seems hopeless. Whatever will happen next. 
So, whilst inside the warg's jaws, Thorin boops its snoot and it lets go. For some reason, Azog then tells his underling to bring him Thorin's head, suggesting that Azog considered humiliating and defeating Thorin to be more important than being the one to actually kill him. So, Bilbo has been watching all of this, and because the movie doesn't show us, we have to assume he is the only one who is in a position to actually help Thorin. Everyone else is conveniently on the other side of the tree, or something. So, because Bilbo is now brave, this of course means that he will throw himself at certain death. Because Gandalf can't know about the ring just yet, Bilbo of course does not use the ring, even though he knows what it does. Additionally, Thorin needs to see Bilbo save him for what comes later. So, because of everything I have just described, both characters being idiots and the world allowing this to happen, the movie is able to give Bilbo his big hero moment. Thorin has looked down on Bilbo from the moment he met him. He has not said a kind word to him, and yet Bilbo has persevered and decided to continue to assist in Thorin's quest. He is now about to single-handedly save Thorin's life, albeit very temporarily if cause and effect are functioning, which of course they are not. It is tremendously unfortunate then that this core narrative idea required such unfettered bullshit to manifest. So Bilbo leaps into the shot from off-camera and kills the orc. True courage is about knowing not when to take a life, but when to spare one. How Azog and the orc did not see him is a mystery because he would have been running directly towards them. What was rule number two for writing Rings of Power again? If it's off-camera, it does not exist. Anyway, Bilbo is then able to defeat this orc in a 1v1, which I do not believe, even if given the element of surprise. Remember, this is not just some rando goblin that he found in a cave, this is an orc that is accompanying Azog on his quest for murder. And at this point I was wondering, what exactly was Bilbo's plan? His whole thing, that has been reinforced repeatedly throughout the movie, is that he is resourceful. He thinks outside the box, as depicted in the troll scene and the golem scene. He is not an effective fighter of which he is very aware. And yet Bilbo's idea of rescue is to follow Thorin into certain death and then… I guess they both die. There is a fine line between being brave and being stupid, Mr. Bilbo. So Azog then tells the orcs to kill Bilbo, because I guess he's feeling really, really lazy today. And then this happens. Okay, so this is an exact retread of the troll scene. Except that this one required that the dwarves escape mortal danger off-screen in order to arrive unseen in time to save Bilbo's life. Additionally, as far as the movie wants us to believe, Azog and his orcs are not halfwits, unlike the trolls. So anyway, the dwarves play whack-a-mole with the orcs, and Bilbo is about to be killed, and then we get our third last-minute rescue in the space of, well, less than a minute. The eagles, I guess, arrived in that five or so minutes during which Gandalf was stuck in the tree, and then they kill the orcs and save the dwarves. Okay, so this is deeply unsatisfying, but I guess the movie has to end somehow. And because the maximum drama was not quite maximum, but nearly maximum, the tree they were all stuck on falls off the cliff just as Gandalf is rescued. Meaning that, had the eagles arrived ten seconds later, they would all be dead. Again, dialing the tension this absurdly high using mortal peril and last second rescues repeatedly just makes the whole thing fundamentally unbelievable. This scene is a catastrophe in terms of visuals, character, theme, and plot. Anyway, we have one scene to go, and then we are finished. Okay, so Ori is clumsy, Bilbo is suicidally brave, he is extremely loyal, he does not use the resources available to him when saving people's lives, and Thorin cares more about vengeance than the lives of his friends, or retaking his home. And he does perhaps have the crazies, as he seems utterly blinded by revenge. So the eagles carry the dwarves some of the way towards their destination, of course no reason is given as to why they didn't go any further, but I guess it's because there are two more movies to go. Thorin is near death, understandably, and everyone is worried. Upon regaining consciousness, Thorin's first words are, oh, and he then appears to berate Bilbo. What were you doing? You nearly got yourself killed. I, I mean, bro, you. This really is a case of the pot calling the kettle suicidal, isn't it? Did I not say that you would be a burden? That you would not survive in the wild? That you had no place amongst us? I have never been so wrong in all my life. Okay. Superficially, I like this. In a better movie, I would really like this. 
Strip away the bullshit, what we have here is Thorin admitting that he was wrong, showing deep respect for Bilbo, thanking him for saving his life, and accepting him as one of them. Thorin has ostensibly grown as a character. Now, the problems. All of the setup in the previous scene that is required for this scene to make sense is incoherent garbage. Thorin's choice of words in this scene are very clearly written for maximum dramatic effect, rather than because he would actually use those words. Any reasonable person would immediately thank Bilbo, but of course, because drama, Thorin's choice of words imply that he very much dislikes Bilbo. The reason for this is so that when we get the switcheroo, I have never been so wrong in all my life. It hits that much harder. We go from a low to a high rather than going from nothing to a high. The script is written so as to maximize the emotional payoff at the end of the film. The priority here is maximum feels, but unfortunately everything else is thrown out in service of this. Anyway, Thorin and Bilbo embrace. Bilbo says that he understands why Thorin doubted him, admitting that he is not a hero, or a warrior, or even a burglar. The party then realize they can see the lonely mountain for the first time, and they observe a bird flying towards the mountain, which, given the prophecy mentioned very briefly at the beginning of the movie, they choose to take as a good omen. We then follow the bird towards Erebor, and we see a great eye open. Smaug has awoken. Cut to the credits. So, that was The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. I'm going to save most of my thoughts for the final autopsy video at the end of this series, but for now I will give a rough overview of my take on this film. There is a tremendous amount of bullshit contained within. This movie suffers from being attached to The Lord of the Rings. The visual effects are inconsistent, sometimes looking absolutely fantastic, other times looking lazy and slapped together. There is a colossal amount of wasted time, and at a guess I would say at least an hour could have been cut from the film, and nothing of value would have been lost. In terms of character, most of them I think are reasonable. The only catastrophic character moment is Thorin charging Azog at the end, and arguably Bilbo doing the same. Apart from that, the greatest crime in terms of character is that many of the characters are superfluous and are not adequately characterized whatsoever. Six of the thirteen dwarves are essentially interchangeable. Plus we have Radagast, who is a bumbling clown who only serves to distract the five-year-olds, and I guess to provide MacGuffins to Gandalf. The primary villain, Azog, is incredibly one-dimensional, his only characterization being Kill Dwarf Man. The design of many of the characters is at odds with the already established world that the movie takes place in. Many of the environments look like a PlayStation game because they were rendered as entirely digital environments, making them feel extremely fake and uninspired, especially when compared with the environments present in The Lord of the Rings. Virtually none of the comedy worked for me, as it was typically at the expense of its characters or at the expense of the world itself. Virtually every action sequence involved insane physics-defying cartoon acrobatics, making it extremely difficult to care about what was going on. There are many sequences that exist to tie this trilogy in with The Lord of the Rings, which oftentimes creates a jarring dissonance between the simplistic core narrative of the book and the uber-blockbuster epic that the studio no doubt wanted so as to cash in on the success of The Lord of the Rings. Now, because I want to end on a positive note, here's an overview of what I like about this movie. Most of the cast is fantastic. Thorin and Bilbo are the two highlights in terms of new performances. The sequence with Gollum I think is mostly excellent. Many of the filmmaking and editing decisions are purposeful and deliberate, such as the framing of the prologue. The music is fantastic throughout, although there are some odd choices of placement which I have already covered. The thematic throughline of Bilbo having to prove himself to Thorin is mostly well done. And there are parts of the film that are genuinely well written. And honestly, that's about it. In comparison to Rings of Power, because I know that's what you're all waiting for, at this point, The Hobbit is far superior in every way, bar one. The tone. For all its faults, Rings of Power did not devalue its characters by throwing in comedy scenes at their expense. Rings of Power is, for the most part, tonally consistent, whereas The Hobbit is absolutely not. An Unexpected Journey was definitely worse than I remember it being, and I am not holding my breath for the next two movies because I definitely recall this one being the best of the three. So anyway, that just about does it for this video. Please, if you have made it this far, consider liking or subscribing if you have not already, as it will help my channel. Also, since my last video, I have, at your urging, set up a Patreon, so if you want to support my work directly, please check it out. The link is in the video description. I have also started doing some live streams on YouTube at 8pm UK time every other Friday, so if you like the sound of watching me fail horrifically at video games and then having a bit of a chat with you guys, then consider tuning in. So that's all for now, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in part two, The Desolation of Smaug.